Hello YouTube. Last year, as a Christmas present for the people who actually support this channel, I decided to make a training playlist that you can find in the description. And for this year, I wanted to come up with something a little bit special in the continuation of my effort to thank you for the time you spend watching the channel and building a community of natural lifters. I wasn't really sure what I was going to go with, but there is a certain individual on the channel that has spent a lot of time posting comments requesting a video about how to get a girlfriend. Now, I won't necessarily always follow the, uh, the, the wills or the demands of people who want certain types of videos on the channel, especially if I think that they're bad or that they're not aligned with what I do. But in this case, the topic of women is something that I've hinted at in the past, in several videos, and something that a lot of you guys are very interested with, and for a very simple reason, the vast majority of my viewers are heterosexual males, and therefore, finding a girl and building a life with a woman is a very important part of being a man. Some would even say that it's actually the only purpose that exists in a man's life. And since just saying that statement, for example, can be quite controversial, I think it's very interesting to discuss it in details. So, for your Christmas present this year, I am making a full segment on how to get a girlfriend, how to understand women, how to make sure that your relationship lasts and are healthy so that you can build a family and have children with that person eventually, and how to deeply understand yourself as a male so as to avoid common mistakes that end relationships or make it so that some men are never able to either find a woman or keep a woman. So this is what we're going to be talking about today. It's going to be a long video. It's going to be a video that's going to be fairly lyrical. So I'm going to take my time. It's not going to be as rigid or severe as some of my other analysis. So if you want to go to a certain point of the video, you can use the timestamps. Now, to make one thing clear, the person who asked for the video used a certain hashtag, and it's an hashtag that caught up because it sounds catchy. And the hashtag was, release the French game. Well, I'm not going to teach you how to game women because women are not a computer to be gamed, okay? It's not a system that you can hack. This very approach is already an issue in my mind because it truly really shows that a lot of men think women to be so foreign that the only way to access them is to trick them, which also means that deep down they have integrated the idea that women don't really want them. Because when you have to trick someone with strategies and nagging to get them to be with you, this means that deep down there is an issue with your confidence. You don't think you're good enough as you are, and therefore you try to change, you try to simulate something in order to actually access girls. That will not be necessary because I will not be sharing any game with you as I have personally no game whatsoever. Now, usually when you say you have no game, people assume it means that you're not good with women. Actually, quite the opposite. I'm fairly gifted when it comes to talking to women. I understand women on a fairly deep level. And I'm, I've always been very successful when it comes to dating, at least past my teenagehood. I say that because the methods and the approach I want to share with you is one that is going to be diametrically opposed to that of the people that you see on YouTube, all of the pickup artists, etc. But to me, it's because I believe I have the correct approach and I believe that theirs is wrong. I think that they are deeply mistaken and the proof is in the pudding because when you look at these men and you look at their lives, not what they say their life is or what they present on YouTube, but their actual life, they tend to be very lonely, they tend to never actually achieve a family, and they never have children. And to me, these are signs that they fucked up at some point, because that's the entire goal when you actually get a girl. The girl is not just sex. They think like children. They have the mindset of, of toddlers. They cannot go beyond that. And usually that comes from men who had a tough time accessing women when they were younger, develop frustrations, frustrations that then turned out their entire world upside down because they ended up being obsessed with sex. And so they saw sex as the end all be all of all relationships and all women. 
and therefore the only thing they seeked afterwards was sex and when they achieve that they think that that's it there's nothing further and yet they're still miserable so they usually project that onto women and they think that it's women's fault it's not women's fault you're not accessing women the proper way you're not tapping into the feminine potential that could make you very happy you're just using them for sex it's the reason why you're so sad and the problem is that usually misery loves company it's more complex than that psychologically these types are not spreading their misinformation in order to make other men miserable. Usually what is happening instead is that they are trying to cope with their own problems by making it so that they present their life as the life that a man should live and it allows them to sleep at night. They feel better about themselves. The problem is that they damage the life of young men when they do that. And since young men are going to also have a very shallow understanding of what women are, it usually works, right? Because when you're 14 and some like 20 year old tells you that he can teach you how to pick up women like this, it's attractive to you. But it should be a, uh, it should be a wake up call for the guy because he's on the same intellectual level as a 14 year old. Because usually the communities of these people are either children, teenagers, or bitter men like themselves. And this is what I want you to do when you take advice from people, it's for everything in life, but especially for women. If you're going to listen to a man's advice about how to get girls, etc., look at their station in life and what they have and what they want, and then assess if that's something that you want too. Most pickup artists, again, are without wife, without children, and their life surrounding and the entire dating thing and the pickup thing is quite sad. Do you want that? Is that the type of life that you want? Do you want the life of a bachelor? I can tell you, and I will go get back to it because it's going to be a main theme of the video, that a life of promiscuity and of casual sex is not a life that is going to lead you to happiness. If you are a teenager, it's not going to be something you want to hear because right now you're obsessed with sex. But I can tell you that if your development was never poisoned by these types, you would have realized that at some point. And I hope I can be the voice that allows you to swerve around all of that misinformation and actually pursue your actual calling in life, which is making so that your masculinity eventually is paired with femininity so that you can actually create a whole. We'll get back to the topic of these two notions later on as well. Now, since I just told you that, this also means that you must know where I'm coming from before I discuss it. So, I'm going to be fully transparent and tell you exactly what I am. Not who I am, because it's not going to be needed. I'm not going to disclose much of my life in this video, but you just need to understand what I do and what I'm about to get where I'm coming from and what my advice is going to be. So, I'm someone personally who had a very tough time with girls growing up, mainly because I wasn't sure whether I liked them or not. I wasn't sexually orientated at all when I was younger. I had other focuses. And I started to realize my attraction to women when I was maybe 15 or 16, when my puberty started actually. But it, it took still a few years for me to then biologically, hormonally feel attracted to women. So I really started getting interested when I was 19, 20, which is very old. And by that time, most of my friends were already way past their virginity. They had multiple girlfriends and I had zero. So I started with a lot of luggage. And the problem is that that type of luggage made me too rash. And my approach to women wasn't the correct one. I was too direct, I made many mistakes, but these mistakes helped me learn. Because at no point did I think it was women's fault. I perfectly understood that in this case, it was my fault. It was my approach that was wrong. So I want to teach you also how to get a girlfriend the proper way, how to approach women the proper way, which is not shared openly on this platform or others. After that, it led to a certain phase of my life where I was what some would call a slayer, where I had many women, I was seeing many women at the same time, and I was using these women for sexual relationships. It's the only thing I was really doing with them. I wasn't dating any of them, but I wasn't 
putting up str uh, firm boundaries. So a lot of them thought that w they could eventually sh secure me if they gave me sex, which never happened, which also damaged the life of these women, which, which is entirely, entirely my fault. And this phase lasted me for, I think, two or three years where I couldn't understand why I wasn't happy because I was getting everything I ever wanted, right? Women loved me. I could have as much sex as I wanted. Again, I was seeing three, four beautiful women in the same week, but it was never fulfilling that, that deeply rooted need that I felt should have been fulfilled by this. And the reason why I felt like this is because culture in general had told me that it was the way to go, right? You're young, you're a man, you should go out, you should see as many women as possible, you should, be a, you should seduce them, etc. To me, it doesn't work like that. And I think that for you, it doesn't work like that either. Because I have had many friends who were like this. I also know all the men who were like this, who are still bachelors in their 40s or 50s. All of these men are miserable. That's the one thing they have in common. And yet they have had hundreds of sexual partners. But it has never made them truly happy. It made them happy in the instant. And it's something I realized as well. And why I want to warn you against the pursuit of a woman just for the sake of sex. It always, of course, is going to feel good. And there's going to be a part of you that is going to feel like you're on top of the wood because you can't could. You managed to seduce a beautiful woman and convince her to have sex with you. Great. You had a good time. But after that, what comes? Well, what comes most time is the void. It's emptiness. It's nothing. You're going to be in bed near someone who you feel nothing for. And it's, it breaks something in you. The more you do that, the more you repeat that cycle, the more you are starting to trap and trap yourself into a lifestyle that is just going to make you more and more miserable and hollow inside. So, even though I personally wouldn't be able to tell you not to do it because I did it myself, I firmly believe that if you were to avoid the mistakes I made, you would be better off. So that's what... This is what this advice is going to be about today. It's coming from a guy who fucked up and eventually was redeemed. Because now I am redeemed. The information I'm going to give you comes from a man who is now in a committed relationship for life. And by for life, I mean until the day I am dead. And this is, to me, the station in my life where I've been the most happy. And where I can, I can see the most happiness in the future. Because I am building something. A real thing, right? With a strong foundation. And I want you to build that thing as well. So, this is advice coming from a guy who's mostly a monk in a committed, monogamous relationship where I'm deeply faithful and I believe that this person is the person that is going to be with me for the rest of my life. I hope, I deeply hope that you can find that person as well. I know for a fact that that person exists for you somewhere. There is no way around that. But the question is, are you, going to, are you going to be able to find them? And are you going to be able to be the correct person when you find them that it works out? Statistically, if you look at the world, there are billions of people. So there's tens of thousands of people on this earth that could be your soulmate. I don't buy into the notion that you have only one soulmate. That's nonsense. There's no certain thing as a twin flame. There are tons of people who would fit your criteria and be very good for you. Tons of them. So don't start off by thinking, oh, there's no one for me. I did the same mistake when I was young. I couldn't relate to women. I couldn't create any connections, be it emotional or intellectual with women. And that created resentment. And I thought that it was my fault. In my case, I saw this as my fault. I was weird. I was, I was a freak. And therefore, I couldn't ever find a woman to build a life with. I was, of course, deeply wrong, but it took time for me to understand it. What needed to change was the way I saw myself and the way I projected what was inside to the public, because I can tell you, and this is, again, the inner, inner knowledge I have, that I have met women who could have been good partners for me, but I wasn't a good partner for them in the instant, so it never worked. Many men are like this. Many of the pickup up artists, the incel, incels are like this. The issue is not what they are. It's not who they are. It's not that they're born cursed. It's that they never actually managed to become the person they should be. And that is the person that would have been able to find a girl and build something. So today, 
I'm not going to spend too much time pointing the finger at women. I'm going to be pointing the finger at you because the problems come from you. But even though I say that, you will still be able to see that this video is going to share some fairly sexist, chauvinist, and sometimes even feminist mindsets into your face because I don't like labels. I have my own beliefs. I make no apologize for them. To me, there are certain realities that need to be said, and if they are sexist, then so be it. They are, in my opinion, the reality, so I want to be able to share them with you. But as I said, I'm going to be sexist towards both men and women. I don't discriminate because I do. See, that's the, that's the entire subtlety of the entire question. I discriminate between men and women because men and women are not the same. And if you're going to discuss the two genders coming together to create a bond, then you have to be sexist because you cannot look at the two sides from the same lens or the same angle. It simply doesn't work. I know that this modern world is now hell-bent on presenting men and women as interchangeable. It is not true. And saying that is actually cruelty. And it's the reason why men and women don't really get along together anymore is because of that. We are trying to just uh, make everything flat or trying to equalize everything. And since we are simply not equal by birth, it doesn't function. A relationship between a man and a woman is based off of inequality. It doesn't mean that one dominates or the, the other, one, other one doesn't, but there are power relations to take into account and they are directly linked to gender. So it's what we're going to get into today with the discussion about how to get a girlfriend healthy relationships, and how to have self-control in said relationships. As I just said, the approach is going to be focused on the biological, but not just that. Because to me, if you're going to discuss women, you need to look at them as creations of science, so of evolution, what they were at the beginning and what they have become through time. But you cannot stop there. See, many incels, many men going their own way, pick up artists, whatever. They want to reduce women to their meanest and simplest expression, which is the biological, because it makes it easier to understand. And they also right, rightfully say that the cultural approach to seducing women doesn't work because too much of culture has been poisoned by people who either want to separate men and women or who have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. It's the reason why I told you to be very careful when you take advice from people, look at their life. Make sure that they actually know what they're talking about. Since getting girls is a very important marker of success as a man, many men lie about getting women. It's the reason why, again, you've heard that old saying. If you ask a guy how many girls he banged, you can divide the number by four. And if you ask a girl how many men she fucked, you can multiply the number by four. It's because for men, it's seen as a good thing to have many partners, and for women, it's the opposite. This is a distinction that is linked in the biological. But it also means that many men are going to lie about their number of conquests, they're going to lie about their prowess. And if you have no experience with women, well, you have no way to actually know if what they're saying is correct or not. So you're going to fall for it and you're going to follow them in their footsteps. And since they're losers, like most pickup artists are, you're going to end up a loser yourself. So you need to have a certain degree of logic and of reasoning. And it's also applying to what I'm going to say. Listen to my words and question them. I might not be correct, but I'm going to try and give you as close to the truth as I can potentially get to. And that to me is a balanced approach, a balanced approach between the biological and the cultural, because women are, yes, creatures, biological creatures, but they're also cultural beings, just like men. Just like you cannot reduce masculinity to just hormones, there's also a cultural part. And this leads to the mistake that many men make. As I said, too many of these people on the internet, the incels, etc., only look at women for their biology, but the opposite side of the spectrum is just as bad, which is the sims and the, the men, feminists, whatever, who only look at women for the cultural aspects of them. The two are wrong, of course, because the two are extremes and they're not balanced. 
if you end up just looking at women as those perfect angels from creation, you're going to put them on a pedestal. And if you look at them just for their biological purpose, you're going to reduce them, you're going to vilify them. And on both sides, it's, ba it's bad. If you vilify women, you're going to end up in a situation where you are developing an intellectual relationship with women that is negative because you see them as beneath you, but at the same time, you lust after them and you want them. So it's going to make you hate and detest something that at the same time you desire, which is very dangerous. And on the other hand, if you put women on a pedestal and you refuse to see them for the vile creatures that they can be sometimes, you're going to just glorify them to the point that are going to be inaccessible. So we're going to look at women for what they are. And what they are is a mix of scientific and poetry. To me, the man who looks at women just via the lens of the scientific is an idiot. And the person who looks at them via the lens of poetry and poesy alone is a fool. They are both. But you'll see that since I'm more of a fool than I'm an idiot, my approach is more lyrical. I have a, a more literature-based understanding of femininity and women. So maybe you're going to vibe with that, maybe not, but we'll get to that. Still, the key approach I'm going to apply is based on evolution. It's an evolutionary approach to dating, to women, etc. Because evolution is not just biological, it's also cultural. So the two work hand in hand. I'm going to use that for the most part. So for the type of, if you're the type of person, the type of man who is going to think that because we now live in big cities with high phones, then the past doesn't matter. Uh, this video is not really for you. Just like if you're the type of man that just wants to fuck chicks, it's not for you either. I think you're deeply mistaken in both cases. I respect your mistakes. To me, it is just not the proper approach. You need to find a woman to build something with her not just fuck her, and to do that, you need to understand what women are, not who they are. Who they are doesn't matter. There's too many women on this planet. You can't know what they, you can't know who they are individually, but you can know what they are. And I know that that statement makes some people scream because they think it's sexist and generalizing all women. Well, all women are cut from the same cloth. They're all women, just like all men have similar traits. It's important to know these traits because if you want to understand women globally, you cannot take the time to learn them one by one. You need to know what they are before you start to learn who they are. And since you're going to want to discover who your lover is, it's going to be first step knowing what, what animal they are deep down. Because that's mostly what creates relationships, by the way. It's that difference that is found in the biological, that then, that then gives birth to the cultural. It's what attracts these opposites together. It's also the reason why this modern era that is trying to turn men into women and men into men is so dangerous. And the reason why people have less and less relationships and less and less children is because we are becoming less attractive for one another. Women like masculinity. Men like femininity. If if men start to lack in masculinity and women start to lack in femininity, we're not going to be as attractive to one another. And that is terrifying because it could lead to the destruction and death of the species. We're not there yet, but we're slowly moving towards that. Even though there are more and more people on this planet, you will see that we will reach at some point the breaking point. For now, it's just really in the West. But the problem is that that type of poisonous cultural corruption spreads. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But that's where I'm coming from. So the drive to reproduce is going to be taken into account because it's the main reason why men and women get together and the cultural layers will be slapped on top of it afterwards with the discussion of the masculine and the feminine, which are notions that are also very contentious. Many people don't agree with what they are. I'm going to give you my plain understanding of what both of these things are. To me, again, keep in mind that you can be a woman and have some masculine traits and you can be a man and have some feminine traits. It's not necessarily bad, but I think that saying that there is no such thing as a masculine or feminine trait is extremely dangerous because that's not true. We have social standards and we arbitrarily assigned characteristics to men and women that are just linked to their character 
but these come from biology. So at the end of the day, they are deeply linked with biological gender. It is impossible to argue against that. People who think that gender is a social construct need to go back to third grade to learn some basic biology. Okay. So we're going to discuss women as creatures. I am going to use terms that are going to be a little bit upsetting for some. I don't really care because you need to understand the beast that they are so that you can understand the beast that you are. You have a deeper understanding of what you are as a creature, as a man, I hope. But I'm still going to teach you some things today because some men are not 100% certain or even aware of what they are. Not who they are, but I have noticed that many people who don't know what they are also don't know who they are because biological identity is linked to cultural identity. So it's going to be an effect qui is cool, as we say in French. It's going to be killing two birds with one stone. You're going to learn about women, and by learning about women, you're going to learn about yourself. Which is also why, if you're a chick and you're watching this for some reason, maybe you're a lesbian, it's also going to help you because you're going to understand men, what men are. And if you understand men, you're going to have an easier time getting a boyfriend. So it also works in a sense. All right. Let's get into the topic, how to get a girlfriend. We're going to start with that. It's the title of the video. It's why you clicked. First off, I want you to think about why you want a girlfriend in the first place. It might sound stupid, but it's very important that you actually take the time to understand why. Because your intent is everything. Intent in life is everything. When you do something, you need to know why you're doing it. If you don't know why, you are most likely going to mess up at some point. You need to have the end goal in mind. And the thing with getting a girlfriend is that it is a cultural thing now, meaning that it's in shows, you discuss that with your friend all the time, you discuss women all the time. So some of you are going to be peer pressured into caring about girls when deep down you don't. And I know that I was like that, where I was maybe like first, first second year of high school, and my friends were saying like, oh, look at the ass on that one, and look at her boobs, and I was like, oh yeah, amazing. And in my head I was thinking about like playing Pokemon and swimming or stuff like this. I knew I should have cared, but I didn't at the time. That's fine, okay? Take your time, be at your own pace, and don't get a girlfriend just because everyone else does. You're not less of a man because you don't have a girlfriend. You're not less of a man because you're a virgin. You're not less of a man because you have never kissed a girl. It's fine. I know that many men obsess over that and it makes them miserable. You go on forums and you have people saying, oh, I'm a kissless virgin and I never held a woman's hand. That's fine. I'm here to tell you it's fine. I think my first kiss, a real like sexually charged kiss, was when I was maybe 20 in my 20s. And then I lost my virginity when I was 21. And now I'm 27 and I am committed with a woman and I'm going to have children with her. So don't worry about all of that stuff. Don't think that just because you had a slow start, it's the end for you. It's not. But that frustration, that hatred you've developed towards your own self, because of it, might be the death of you because it's going to prevent you from actually moving forward. So move forward always and keep your intent in mind. After that, you need to think about the type of companionship that you are seeking. Once you have said, okay, yes, I do want a girlfriend. All right. Well, we all want a girlfriend or woman for the same reason. It's for companionship. But there are many categories and many different types of companionship. The first one and the most obvious being lust. Many teenagers want a girlfriend because they want to fuck her. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? I'm not the type of guy who is going to tell you that sex is bad. Sex is beautiful. Sex is sacred. Sex is a human need. And with sex comes a plethora of other things. Touch, intimacy, the ability to trust someone with your body. All of that is incredibly important. Men, a lot of men don't realize it, but what they call lust and really encapsulates those three aspects. The most important one being touch. Many men don't realize it. What they want is not some dick to swallow their... Uh, some dick. Ooh. It's not some chick to swallow their dick whole. What they want is a girl to touch them, to actually put their hands on them, to hug them. And it's something that is fairly, you know, feminist in a sense to even say, because it's not considered to be a masculine trait. It's even supposed to make you feel, in a sense, a bit like a bitch. 
If you express the fact that you would want people to touch you, that you would want hugs, that you need people to actually be in contact with you, but it's not, it truly isn't. And if you start detesting that aspect of you and you think it makes you weak and soft, you're going to start to demonize the very approach that would lead you to actually receiving that and it's going to make you miserable. You're a man, okay? You're tough, you're whatever you want, but at the end of the day, you are still a social creature and you need warmth, you need contact. Women get that all the time. They touch each other all the time. Men don't. So that might be what you think is lust. What is pushing you towards women is not just the want to empty your balls. It's the need for intimacy. And that is perfectly normal. I will not shun you for that. You're not a bad person for wanting that. But you need to be able to know it. Because it's going to help you distinguish in your head between that or just primal lust, that is sexual drive. Some men are like that. Some men just want women to fuck them. And in that case, the question I have for you is, isn't your hand enough? If you're just going to use a woman as a flashlight, why don't you just jerk off? Because at the end of the day, you wouldn't get from sex what you should be getting from it, which is intimacy. If that's the case, you need to reassess, you need to take some, some, some steps back and think about it. Because if you start doing that, you're going to end up in the situation I was. And in my case, as I said, like many men, I thought I wanted sex for sex sake. What I wanted instead was a connection with someone. But because I was never able to see beyond the sex, I would just have sex with random women and then for nothing... And then do it again, hoping, okay, next time, next time it'll work. Well, it never did, because I was always keeping it physical. A relationship with a woman cannot just be physical. They are incapable of that. We can pull it off, but it's not good for us. So, go beyond that. Really, really talk to yourself and try to see where you're coming from. It also is, in a sense... As I said, a feminist stands to say that. When you say that men are not just baboons that want to empty their balls, it actually also means that what we seek in women is not reduced to sex. Many people say that men are pigs or men are dogs. Well, I mean, in a sense, we are. We are dogs. But what do dogs want? They want affection. They want love from their owner. It's also what we want. We have been reduced to our sexual drive but it's truly not a fair representation of what men are. It isn't. And by doing that, by allowing yourself to accept that fact, you're also going to be able to access what women are. Because if you approach women from a sexual and physical standpoint alone, you're going to spend the rest of your life never able to access what they have inside. And the true treasure of a woman is her heart. I know it's cheesy to say, but... Yes, fat asses are great and boobs and whatever. It's good. It looks good, of course. It's attractive. But it's not what makes a relationship last. It truly isn't. The physical is important, but if it's just that, it goes nowhere. So, allow yourself to go beyond. Allow yourself to actually access the feminine beauty that could be yours if you didn't let yourself fall for it. I hope that makes sense. I want you to be able to understand that the physical appearance of a woman that attracts you towards her is, in a sense, just the start. It's just the beginning. That's like, it's, it's step number one, okay? You, th that, that is, it's verified, it's okay, now the physical attraction is there. It allows you to then access the spiritual, the mental, and deepen the connection. And in a perfect word, sex would only happen at that point, when the connection is already deep. Modernity has completely ravaged that. That's over. Even for my generation, that was over. I, most women I see, I saw or dated for a brief period of time, we had sex the first day. Like the first day I met them, we had sex. So I hope that your generation, the people younger than me, my little brothers, will be able to go back to a healthier approach where you wait for sex and you make sex what it is, which is a, an emotional connection. I don't know if it's going to be possible because, again, the teenager in you just wants to fuck. And since women are extremely easy nowadays, well, it's going to be at your disposal. So if you are able, in your teenagehood, to resist that urge, then I salute you because 
you are a better man than I was at that age. So, that was for lust. If you want a girlfriend for lust, these are the questions you need to ask yourself. After that, we can talk about loneliness. Many men are extremely lonely. Most people actually who express feelings of extreme loneliness are men. Most people who kill themselves because of extreme loneliness are men. This is also not something to be ashamed of. You are lonely because you're a social creature. You have been sold the idea that men are like these wolves and that we shouldn't need love and we can just survive in the jungle by ourselves for 15 years. That's not true. It's the reason why, by the way, solitary confinement is a form of torture. It's because it makes you go insane to not have the ability to have social interactions with others. And even men who are outliers in terms of that suffer from it. I am personally an extreme loner and a monk. And yet I can remember and think back to periods of my life when I spent maybe five, six days without talking or touching another human, and I was starting to go insane. The person without me was receding, and the animal was taking more and more space. And I saw that it wasn't good. I was slowly losing my mind. So, you might be in that situation as well. And the worst thing is that you are being told by society as a whole that because you can't get a girl, you are a failure as a man, and it makes you feel even worse. It's a, it's a very vicious psycho that is just making you dig your own grave and you will never see the light again. Accepting that is the first step, okay? You want a mate because you feel lonely. My solution to you is not going to be something you want to hear, but you need to hear it here. A woman will not be able to fix your problems. Even if by miracle you manage to actually grab a woman and she wanted to date you in your sorry state, you would just make her miserable because women don't like needy men. Women don't want needy men. It's based off of evolution. If you are needy, it means that you don't have any other options, so you're not a good mate. So most women are going to avoid you completely. And the few that will take you in are going to eventually hate your guts because you're not the proper person for them yet. Doesn't mean that you can't be, but you need to fix yourself. So what you need to do is you need to accept yourself as your own best friend. You need to spend time with yourself. You are alone, but you're never truly spending time with yourself. And that is a problem. Your mind is constantly wishing and fantasizing about other people, about other women you will stay in that state of dream-like existence until you spend the rough and tough time to actually talk to your own self and discover who you are. And at that point, you can seek social interactions. But trying to find a girlfriend to complete who you are and make you feel happy is not going to work. I can tell you that it has never, ever worked. And even if it did, what happens when the girl leaves? What happens when the relationship breaks down? You're going to go right back down to that deep, dark hole. So it's not sustainable. And the thing too, and it's something I shared on the channel already one time, is that if you're going to go find a girlfriend, you will want a person that completes you. But if there's nothing to complete, what happens? Right? If, if I put two blocks together, while well, the two blocks have pre-existing substances that allow the two together to create a structure. But for you, there's nothing. There's not even a block. So what? She has to do all the work. She has to make all of the blocks herself. It's going to exhaust her and it's not going to function. So make yourself, build yourself up before you actually seek something else outside of the self. You don't need to be complete. You don't need to be perfect to get a girl. That's also a problem that I see many people have where they wait to be ready. Well, you'll never be ready, right? I have progressed and made character evolutions at a pace now with my girl that I've never made in the past. And that's also what makes women so gorgeous and beautiful is that they are designed to push men forward. If you find a good woman, she will make you progress. That also means that you need to make sure that you don't find a woman that stabilizes you or makes you regress. Many women are also like that. They are poisonous. They are not good women for you. And uh, in this case, this means that you will get to grow with someone. But before you grow with someone, you need to have some growth of your own. Just to be able to know what you like. Because if not, you're going to be the type of dude that dates just about anyone. Because he's so desperate that any amount of attention he gets is a revolution in his brain. Like, I know guys 
when a girl just smiles to them, they fall in love. You know why? Because they have such a low self-esteem that they think it's the best they can do. Like the best thing they can get from a woman is a smile and therefore that person becomes their new love. I can tell you one thing. I know that men like to say that women are too subtle and they send signs and we don't get it. It's part of that. That comes from the mindset that women are completely different foreign creatures and we can never hope to understand them. And we, they send us signals from Mars that are impossible to interpret. That's not true. Women are not subtle at all when they want you. A girl that wants you is going to constantly look at you in the eyes. She's going to touch you any chance she gets. She's going to... I mean, I was the type of guy who couldn't see signs to a point where it was ridiculous. But with hindsight, I realized that a lot of the women that wanted me made it super, super obvious. And I was just completely blind. But it wasn't because I was stupid. It was because I had no confidence. And my lack of, lack of confidence made it impossible for me to actually accept the fact that some women would be into me. That is something that you need to fix first and foremost before you start to get a girlfriend. And this also is going to lead to your ability to know your own love language. Now, the love language thing a lot of people think is some stupid, uh, like stupidity just for women. And it, it doesn't make any sense. It's a deep, it's a psychological truth. We all have certain ways we express our love and we have certain ways we like to receive love. How are you supposed to create the tree of love with a woman if you don't even know what you love? It's not going to function. Again, develop yourself first. I think for me, the years where I spent the most time working on myself was from the time I was 14 to the time I was 21. That was most of the time I spent. That seven years where I had almost no relationships with women because I needed to invest that in myself. For men who had difficult childhoods or difficult relationships with your peers, etc., that's the time that you're going to have to put in. Because you should have been doing that in your early teens, but you didn't. For a reason X or Y, that's, that might be not your fault, but it's now your responsibility to take the time to actually recreate yourself and then go out there and find a mate. And this is why, by the way, games are entirely stupid. All of these pickup artists that you see are like that. There are men who never developed a true identity, they don't have much to show for, and therefore they have to resort to tricks. I can tell you for a fact that all of the women I ever seduced, I never had to trick any of them. I never had to tell a lie. Why? Well, because just being myself is enough. There's no need to invent like millions of dollars in the bank or a Ferrari or I don't know, some the lies that men come up with to get women when you are actually yourself, when you have developed something attractive. And by attractive, I don't just mean physically. I mean in terms of energy. That's mostly what is going to matter here because if you want to hear about the physical you can check the description i put the video on looks maxing there but it's limited like the amount of change you can make about the way you look is limited it's important super important but it's most important because it changes the way you feel about yourself and the way the world feels about you as you expand as you actually try to become yourself and it's what's going to be so important Games are just, in a sense, band-aids that you slap on that. Like, you're a deeply wounded individual and male, but you think that if you put enough golden band-aids on, women are not going to notice. Well, one, they will, because they're not dumb. And two, at some point, the band-aids fall off. Then what? What happens? Well, what happens is nothing, because these guys who game women tend to see women as just entities to grab for a night and fuck it's the reason why they don't care if the band-aids come off but if you want to build something for the long term you absolutely need to pay attention to that because it's impossible to keep up a front forever you will eventually lie and also it's a torture is the reason why myself i have a strict policy about lies i simply don't do it i don't lie it's not because i'm a pure angel of moral it's because it's too tiring I don't want to have to remember my lies. I just want to be who I am. And if people don't like it, they can go fuck off. Be like that. It's the best gift I can give you. Be like that. Okay. Stop trying to invent 
who you are, reinvented instead, put in the work. I know that it's tempting to just lie because I used to be like that. I used to be the guy who felt bad about himself and had nothing to say. So I invented stories. But the thing is that these stories just, they pile up on top of one another and then you carry them on your shoulders. I was lucky enough that at some point I was able to shrug them off, but some men never do. And they just, it waits on them. And you see that a ton with the insult and the forums about women are evil and they are, I, I got married one time and it ruined my life. All of these men are the same. There are guys who at some point or the other had a bad encounter with a woman, one woman, and then they try to make this the entire experience of the planet. Like, like every woman is like that. And it's because they have, they have confused who women are individually and what they are. They're confusing cultural and biological. As a whole, women are not witches that are going to go after your money and suck you dry and then leave you for dead. That's not what they are. It's actually the complete opposite of what they are. What I just described right now is toxic femininity. It is the exact opposite of femininity, which is the nurture, the ability to create life. We'll get back to that later. I'm going, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but it's important that you keep that in mind. The games don't function. The people who put the game, push the games, have to push the games because it's the one thing that they have because their identity is incomplete. You need to be able to have a complete identity. identity. And uh, the, the complete identity is going to be important, especially if you want to avoid bad relationships. As I said, all of these men, and that's especially prevalent in the men going their own way movement, were men with weak identities who were vampirized by a woman that actually preyed off of that weak identity. And then after they got fucked over, instead of thinking, okay, the problem was me. I'm the one who attracted that, that creature into my life, that creature that damaged me. Instead, they think, oh no, it's women. Like, womankind is the worst and it's not my fault. No, it's your fault. It's like women who date a bad boy and they get beaten up or whatever. It's the woman's fault. She's the one who selected that mate. She's the one who didn't have the proper filter put in place. Now, can we say that she deserves it? No, but hopefully she will learn. And hopefully men that have bad relationships with certain women will learn as well that the problem came from them. It's your identity that's the problem. And it's something I want to insist on because when we're discussing how to get a girlfriend, your identity is key to be able to find a good mate, but also to preserve yourself. A relationship is supposed to be something that enri enriches your life. If it makes it worse, what even is the point? Many people don't get that. Like I said, it sounds obvious. Many people do not get that, especially women. Women are especially bad about it. And it's the reason why I say also, and I said, that you need to take your time and think about why you want a girlfriend and not rush into it. Because if you're going to actually build something with the person, you're going to spend time with them and that's time you're not spending with yourself. So if you don't have a strong identity to start with, get what, guess what happens? Your identity starts to develop alongside the other. You are like a vine that is growing intertwined with another vine. What happens when you try to separate the two? You can't. You break something. And I have seen that, as I said, especially in women. I know several women who dated too young when they were 14 or 15, stayed with a guy for like three years. And when the guy broke up, they were shattered. And what I mean shattered, I mean that these women now today are in their 30s and they haven't recovered yet. They still hate men or distrust men. And by default, it means they distrust themselves because they deeply desire a relationship with the other gender but they can't bring themselves to it because they were betrayed once. The reason why they were betrayed is because their identity was too weak. And when your identity is weak and you develop it with someone else, if the person at some point shoves you away, what they do is they also shatter the common identity. A couple is not an entity. Okay, a couple is two people. It's two individuals. When it stops being two individuals, it's when it becomes toxic. It's when you become codependent and you will see that there is a fine line to it because 
it's important to be able to, of course, relate to your partner and to feel like you're almost melting together with them, but never to the point where your individuality disappears. I can tell you that sometimes I'm with my partner and it feels like we're one person because we're so connected. And by the way, if you look at sex in terms of symbols, it's also what it is. Sex with someone you love at some point or the other during the act, it's going to feel like you're one person. That's the beauty of it. It's, it's masculinity and femininity coming together to create something supreme. What I describe now, many people will never access because to be able to have that, you need to come in the relationship a man and she needs to come in the relationship a woman. So you are go both going to progress, progress, progress like vines. And at some point you meet, some point, but not when you just start growing because Let's say you meet here and at some point there's a breakup. Okay, fine. You still have all of that base and structure down there. That's your identity. If your identity started intertwined with the other person, you are screwed, especially if they're older than you. And that's why women who date older men take a big risk. The guy can be with you a few years and then ditch you and take a younger girl. He has all of the identity built up beforehand and you don't. I'm getting ahead of myself. That's not even the topic of the video, really. So let's recenter. As I said, a dependent identity is dangerous and toxic. On top of that, women do, do not like dependence, so it's for your best benefit to have a strong individuality before you start chasing girls. And as I said previously also, if you're just getting a girlfriend to follow social norms, you are going to find that it's going to push you towards getting one too early. I don't have a specific arbitrary age to give you, but I would say that you should start dating lightly when you're around 16, 17. Before that, I don't really see the point. I mean, I know, and it's something that you see, especially a ton on insole forums where they regret not having sex in their teenage years and they think, oh, I'll never know teenage romance. Well, I have something to say to you guys. You didn't miss anything. Teenage romance sucks. It's boring because it's just two people who have not developed yet and therefore they have nothing to offer to one another. It's still something that can happen, but you'll be better off just spending the time working on yourself. It truly really is what it means. And I'm sure and certain that most people who date young end up damaging themselves because these relationships are never positive. It never makes a positive influence on their life ever. It's always something that they come to regret because it's wasted time. It's something that across the board I've always seen. So that's my advice to you. If it happens, it happens. But don't be obsessed with to the point that you forget to live, right? Enjoy your childhood. Enjoy your teenagehood. Be free. And then at the point where you have built who you are, move forth into the wood. And so this concludes the, the questionment about yourself and what motivates you to actually get a girlfriend. So now that we have actually answered that, we can get into the how-to, right? Because <laughs> you're used to it now, the videos are long as fuck. So in reality, this was an introduction following the introduction. Getting a girlfriend. First off, what is a girlfriend? A lot of people don't think about things like this because most people don't know how to relationship. So they are going to try and get with someone to build something that they know nothing about and they know nothing about the person that they are seeking to try to fulfill something they don't understand. So it leads to nothing. The discussion about what a girlfriend is, is very simple. A girlfriend is a potential lifelong mate. That's what it is. It's a potential wife if you want to use the institutionalized uh, nomination of what we call a lifelong mate nowadays. It's your spouse. This is true across the board, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be an absolute truth for every single woman you date, because every woman you date will not become your spouse. That would be ridiculous. It's a mistake that many men make, who then marry their high school sweetheart. You don't know shit about the wood. This is the first woman you ever met. It's a terrible idea to just settle for her. I say that because it also leads to me telling you that I am personally not, not against the idea of having multiple sexual partners as long as it takes place within committed relationships. That is the key of it. If you have sex with like 10 women in your life, 
but you dated the 10 women and you were trying to build something with them and it just ended up not working, I'm fine with it. But don't me, don't be like me. Don't be like me. I've had sex with many, so many women I can count, but only one of them I built something with. All of the others were just for sex and they just damaged me. I truly think that, you know, uh, we, we, there's the meme about the body count, like how many people you fucked. I think it's very appropriate to call it a body count because these are skeletons in your closet. These are things that are going to weight you down. If the sex happens in committed relationship instead, it's a net positive because it's healthier, right? It's, it's an emotional connection that creates something. For me, I've always found that casual sex destroys. I've always felt more empty after and also the constant chase of casual sex made me a worse person. It truly did. I was developing certain mean streaks. I was starting to even look down on love because of course I was constantly making fun of love because sex is the ultimate expression of it. But I was having sex with people I didn't love. So I was degrading my own ability to love. And that's the truth. A lot of the bachelors that have random sex with tons of women in their under 30s or 40s, they might be to a point where they will never be able to actually find a lifelong mate because they're too damaged. And it's the same with women, by the way. Women who have tons of partners and then think like, oh, I can't find a good man. Well, it's because you're not a good woman. You ruined yourself. So now you can't find someone that would see you as gold because you're not. And it's awful to say things like this, but I think that if we were to say it, most people and more people will realize it and not make the same mistakes. You need to preserve yourself. If it means no sex before marriage, you do you. I don't think it's the best because sexual, uh, sexual, sexual capability, sexual compatibility is very important because, as I said, it's an expression of love. So, dating people having sex with them, etc., is all part of that selection process. And you're going to weed out the ones that don't make it. And women do the same thing. Women, a woman can have sex with 10 men in like five years, as long as she actually vetted them all and thought, okay, this one doesn't work and this one doesn't work, it's fine. The sex is going to happen at the point, at some point of the relationship or the other, when you guys fall close enough together. So it's natural, right? Again, I will not tell you to not fall for sex or to shame your own sexual drive, it's not the point. I expressed that in the NoFab video. It's perfectly normal to feel attracted to women who are built for that. Now you need to understand why you're attracted and make good use of it. Understand it. And not all women pan out, of course, or else we'll all have 15 women. But if you are being serious about the selection process, you will find that you will not have so many of them who end up being duds. All of my relationships were duds and I was lying to myself saying, oh, well, she's not good for me. Now, she could have been good for me. I wasn't good to her or for her because I was using these women. So I never gave myself the chance to actually find what could have connected us because I stopped at just sex. And I was lucky to be in a sense, dragged out of that by a very courageous woman who understood what I could be. She saw my potential and she was willing to dig all of the shit that I had piled on top of me to access the gold. But she could have, she could have well not done it, right? I owe her a lot because she saved my ass in reality. I was heading a very dangerous, down a dangerous path. You might not encounter such a gorgeous and wonderful woman in your life. It might, you might not be as lucky as I was. So you're going to have to save yourself. And to do that, you need to just not make the same mistakes I made. And that is part of it. Be serious. Okay. Life is more than just getting pussy. Okay. Don't, I know that women have started doing that. I do not understand why. Actually, no, I do understand it's because of feminism, but too, too many women reduce themselves to their pussy. Like they say, oh, I have that good pussy and I'm good in bed. Like, okay, is that all you are? Because that's biological, that's you were born with this. It's not interesting, it's not important. It's the reason why sex workers are pathetic. They're using something that takes no effort to make money. There's no, there's no respectability in that. There's no respectability in being a woman and being attractive just because you have big boobs and a fat ass. Like, nature gave you that. What can you put on the table beyond that? 
Because the thing too is that we will get to a point where these, will, these traits will be replicable via artificial intelligence. It's already almost the case, meaning that a lot of men are getting that, all of the gorgeous women, via porn. But does it fulfill them? Does it make them happy? No. Does it make the women happy? No, because they're not getting the men either. Or the men they're getting are just using them. And that's also part of the discussion, right? You will meet women who have been brainwashed the same way you have been brainwashed into you just wanting sex and then just constantly using the attributes to attract men. And then they are going to be sad because the only thing they get is sex. You are going to be sad because you never get more than just sex. And the two genders are fully fucking miserable. So that's, that's the way to swerve around that, okay? You be serious. When you get a girl, when you are chasing a girl, ask yourself, why am I chasing her? And what do I want to build with that person in the future? That is very important. Don't get a girl just because she has a pussy. Every single girl on earth has one. Okay, there's, there's a literal 4 billion pussies on this planet. There's too, ma there's too many of them. Okay, the market is, is, the market is just, it's just overwhelmed by the amount of pussy. And again, you might not believe me when I tell you that, but... We live in the day and age where getting laid is the easiest it's ever been. For some men. Some people say the top 10%, some people say the top 5%, who cares? It's true that the hypersexualization of society and hypergamy is being pushed to the point that it's sort of like money in a sense. The top 5% of men get more and more girls. And the rest, the, the bottom 95%, get almost none. The thing is that this makes no one happy, right? Because even the top 5% of men are not happy because of that, because just sex doesn't make you happy. The only way to fix this situation is to see beyond that, to see beyond just the sex. And that is going to be tough. Because the advice I give you is not what most people tell you to do, especially when talking to teenagers. I understand right now that what I'm doing is the equivalent of pissing in a violin, as we say in my language, je pisse dans un violon. I'm telling teenage boys to not focus so much on sex and to see beyond the boobs and the ass. It's, it's, it's an impossibility, right? It's like trying to teach a cat how to play the, the piano. Good luck, right? That cat is not going to hold, hold a concert anytime soon, but it's still worth trying because I know that deep down it's what works, it's what's functioning. So, Women are more than just their bodies, even if they objectify themselves, with which they're doing more and more while at the same time being empowered, which is, of course, total fucking bullshit. It's your responsibility as a man to try and find a good one. Avoid, <coughs> avoid the ones that function like this. Usually the ones that are reducing their own self to only their body are not girlfriend or wife material. So that's already dues that you can push away. Now, where to find a girlfriend? Well, the most obvious is school. School is where you're going to, to meet most girls. It's where you're going to have the easier time having social interactions with girls. This means that there are really primordial years of your life where you're going to have a chance to have a girlfriend. If you go to college, it means that between the age of 14, around that time where you start getting interested in girls, and the age of 20 to 23, that's where you will meet the most women in real life. And that is where most of the dating potential resides. Most of your potential is there. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to feel bad if you never dated in middle school or high school. Uh, because at the end of the day, these types of relationships don't pan out. They don't really go anywhere. And as I said, they don't really help you out. So understand that your life doesn't necessarily end after you're out of school, but that when it comes to being around women, school is the most important time. Now, just because you don't date these women doesn't mean that you cannot talk to them. You can practice because it's a little bit funky or funny to say, but I firmly believe that if in school we learn German and Spanish and French, we should also learn women. Because women speak a different language from our own. It's not entirely foreign. It's like a dialect, in a sense. And learning that language, learning how to hear it, interpret it, and then speak it, 
is incredibly important. A man that can speak woman is going to have a very easy time in life. And that is a skill that, just like any language acquisition, is easier to learn when you're young. So, instead of focusing so intently on dating these chicks when you're young, try to talk to them. Try to develop the ability to connect with them and to see them for what they are, which is humans. Girls are not different to the point where we cannot get them or talk to them. Many men are petrified of women. They are afraid of women even because they think they are so different and they think, oh, I can, I will never be able to relate. That's not true. That's what you told yourself, but that is certainly not true. And it's going to lead to either hatred, like with the incels, or blind love, like the sims. And guess what? These two don't work. These two don't function because they're not aligned with what women truly are. Get to, kn get to know them. Get to discover women. When you get a girlfriend, it's going to be a big part of the relationship. It's you discovering who she is. It's, it's also a lot of the fun in those relationships. If you have actually a proper committed dating situation. So that's what school is going to be like. Now, <clears throat> hobbies. Hobbies is what's going to take the second biggest spot in your life when it comes to actually meeting women. The good thing with hobbies is that the girls that you meet have things in common with you. Most people I know that are my age in committed relationships who are married with kids met their partner at some sort of hobby or the other. Because it's where you have the highest uh, compatibility. I'm sure that this is not a word. I've been using that word, but it's not a word. Like, like, no, compatibility. La, la, ah, c'est incroyable. La, oh, c'est horrible. Okay, if someone remembers the name, I hate it when I can't find an, uh, a word like this. Compatibility, I don't know. Okay, never mind. So, in those hobbies is where your chances are going to reside, which also means that it's going to encourage you to have social interactions. Many men who are stuck at, oh, I can't forget about getting a girlfriend, I can't even meet a girl. Well, it's because you're most likely a complete shut-in and you never go outside. Meet people. Doesn't necessarily mean that you want to go out just to date, but you, you love things, right? You're not just a guy in your bedroom that's just looking at the wall like this. Don't lie to yourself. You love things. You have passions. You might be ashamed of these passions, but there are people who won't be. So find your people. Find the people who love what you love. They might not be, there might not be a ton of them. They might not even be women, but just being able to discuss with them, building social bonds is going to make it easier for you to get a girl eventually. And then you have the social settings I already described. But to me, the place you want to avoid at all costs is the social settings. Uh, the, sorry, the, the dating websites. Dating websites are the pits. It's the worst of the worst. To get women, many men resort to them because they cannot meet women outside, or at least they think that. And therefore, they just go where women are, which is those websites like Tinder, etc. Now, if you observe these websites for a second, you will realize that they are deeply skewed towards women. They are completely created and structured around the ability of women to pick and choose. Because, just like marriage, and it's something I'm going to get to afterwards, institutions that either permit or allow the selection of mates tend to be skewed towards the ability of women to make the most of them. And that is something that I've always found. It is therefore very dangerous for males to enter these environments because there is an imbalance of power, an inherent imbalance of power. And the thing is that this imbalance is already there in real life. Women have a much easier time finding a mate. It's easier for a woman to go through a selection process because they have a ton of choice. Even ugly women get guys. They, get, they, they have the ability to have a family. And this is not true for you. For men, it's tougher than that. We have, in a sense, that desperation in us of thinking that you'll never get a girlfriend because there's a voice in you that says that it's a possibility. Maybe you will never get a girlfriend, but you will certainly never get a girlfriend if you use dating websites because you already can't cut it in real life with the selection process tuned in at 20%. Now you enter dating websites where the selection process is 95%. What did you think was going to happen? Of course, it's even worse there. And I see so many young men who say, oh, I'm on Tinder and no one swipes on me. Well, of course, no one swipes on you. 
No one swipes on you in real life already. Why did you think was going to be the difference in on a platform that is basically hypersexualized and where hypergamy is the name of the game? It's just not working. So vacate these websites as fast as possible. I know that they have women. The women on these websites you don't want. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Girls that use Tinder tend to not be girlfriend or wife material. Because they tend to be girls who are deeply addicted to, to, uh, to attention. They need their fix of attention. And they have started to integrate the idea that they're like queen bees. Because they have better orbiters all around their hips and their waist. And so their brain is completely mush. It's, they've been brainwashed by this amount of attention. These are the women that are going to eventually wake up one day and realize that they have damaged themselves beyond repair. And they're not a suitable mate anymore. It's their problem. If they can't see it before it happens, too bad for them. But for you, don't participate in that system. Don't feed it. it. It just simply doesn't function. And I'm sure some people will tell me that they met their significant other on a dating website. Good for you. You are what is known as an exception. But these websites are truly terrible for the dating world as a whole. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things to say about these websites. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I highly discourage you from going on them. Favor real. Favor the real world and the connection with others. Also because it's going to actually fulfill that need for connection that you are. Need that cannot be fulfilled by the internet. Again, many of these incels end up on these forums because it's the only consolation that they have. But this only makes it worse. Because it never makes them feel better. They are, full, they are surrounded by people who are just as toxic as, and negative and down on their luck. So it's a cycle that repeats itself where it's like a dark hole of negativity. And the only escape from that is real life. Internet can be a blessing. Right now you hear me through the internet. But it can also be a curse. And it has truly damaged the relationship between men and women to a great extent. Because these relationships only happen in real life. They cannot happen online. And so, since so much of it is now concentrated online, it also means that so much of it has actually disappeared. You don't really see people on the street having discussions anymore. Back in the days, keep in mind that your grandparents and your parents, when they met, at some point, your dad went up to your mom and chatted her up. He didn't just send a text on Twitter or whatever the fuck. It's the reason why it worked back then and why it's not working now. So push it away. It's a tool of modernity and it's not something that is going to lead to your happiness. Now we are going to switch settings and I am going to start discussing with you the traits that women find attractive, how to behave as a man to actually get girls and more importantly, to keep them. In the second part, I'm mostly going to be talking about the psychology surrounding women, what you need to know about them, and really what you need to think about to understand them and be more attractive in their eyes. Because it's a game of understanding. If you don't get what women are, you're going to have problems. And many men are like this, where they know what they like, but they are not sure what women like, and so they just make do with whatever they have, which is their own preferences, and they project, and you see that mostly on incel or red pill forums who think that they have attained the truth about what women are, but really what they're discussing is what they themselves are. They never really talk about women. They discuss men projection onto women, and that is simply not the way to actually be attractive in their eyes. So, there are a few things to keep in mind when you're going to try and attract a girl or you have a girl that you like and you want to make her your girlfriend. And these are the following. The first stuff, the first one is going to be that approaching a woman is something that needs to be done with subtlety. Okay, women are fragile creatures. You cannot approach them the way you would want to be approached. Many men would see no problem with a girl just walking up to them and grabbing their arms and saying, hey, do you want to go out with me? Many men actually would love that. It would be a fantasy of yours. For women, it doesn't work like that for one simple reason. As I've explained, they have their pick of the leader. They can get whatever man they want. So, because they have an overabundance of options, 
they have a ton of direct uh, attempts done at them on a daily basis. A pretty girl receives dozens of compliments every day. She gets approaches on the street all the time. So it's not going to be the right method to get at her. But if you're not upfront enough, you're going to get in a situation where the girl is going to start to believe that you're just a friend. So it's a very fragile balance between making it known that you're interested while at the same time not being too rash. And it's a balance that many men cannot strike. As I've said, for me, when I finally exited my cocoon and I started to actually try and date girls, I was way too upfront because I spent too many years being too shy and therefore I was compensating. And you see that with pickup artists with their cold approaches, which in reality only work one time out of a hundred and don't really lead to anything sustainable. So your goal is going to try and create a connection with a woman and play on the ambiguity of the situation. That's how every single relationship starts. It's ambiguous. You don't know if you're really friends, if there's something more, and that's what is making it work. Because that tension is something that women crave. Women like that. And it's not always sexual tension. It can just be uncertainty. The girl doesn't know. And when the girl doesn't know where you stand, it's very attractive. Now, at some point or the other, you're going to have to make your intention clear. But if you do it too early and not enough pressure has built up, nothing is going to happen. You need to light the fuse just at the right moment. But if you wait for too long, the explosion is not going to actually take place because the dynamite is going to be completely moist and therefore it won't work either. This is something that cannot be taught. It's a social skill. You have to develop it. For me, I think I got shut down maybe 15 times in a row before I started to understand it. And what I mean in a row, I mean that I got bashed again, again, and again by women that I found attractive, who I wanted to date and who told me that it would never happen. And it's something you're going to have to go through. Okay. Women don't have to go through that, but rejection is a normal part of dating for males. So get used to it you are going to get rejected times and times again and it's okay because it's making you more resilient and it's teaching you valuable skills. For example, the skill of toughness, mental emotional toughness when it comes to women not wanting you. The vast majority of women don't want you. That is perfectly normal because even the top most attractive men are not guaranteed to strike. I mean, no man is guaranteed to get that way with a girl. Women don't function like this. A very attractive woman could get every single guy she tries her hand at. That's possible. I'm sure that if you sent a gorgeous woman at a bar, she could get a hundred of the men that she actually flirted with. You can send the most gorgeous man on earth to the same bar. Out of a hundred women, he might get 10, maybe. Because, as I said, women are much more standoffish and selective when it comes to actually accepting a mate. There is an entire ritual that they make you go through. And that ritual, if you want a serious relationship with a woman, you cannot bypass. You have to go through it. It's something that women get to impose. It's their power. The power of the man starts when the relationship is on the way. Women have most of the power beforehand. It's something we're going to discuss as well. Now, this implies taking risks. Because when you actually shoot your shot with a girl, you're taking a risk. You're opening yourself up because you're vulnerable. Okay, when you, not necessarily when you even admit to your feelings, but when you say, hey, I like you, do you like me back? You give her an opportunity to hurt you. Now, for the men who are afraid of that, understand one thing. Women are very sensitive, but also very kind creatures. A woman will never use what you gave her, that, 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 that tiny opening in your armor, to hurt you. For me, it's never happened in my life. Every time a woman shut me down, she was more embarrassed than I was, and she always made sure I felt okay. Women, unless you're just talking to them directly on the streets, will rarely shut you down aggressively, because it's just not who they are. If you have a relationship with the woman, she's going to let you down easy. So it's up to you to not be so scared and actually try it. And you absolutely have to try it because if you don't, you're going to get 
friend zoned. Now, the friend zone is one of these concepts that was made up by men who are not popular with women, so they invent reasons and they made it something negative, like it's women's fault that you get friend zoned. And you see the way men discuss the friend zone as a punishment. Like, oh, she friend zoned me. Well, yes, she does because you're not boyfriend material. That's why. If you get friend zoned, it's your own fault. Again, personal responsibility in dating is extremely important. The woman has assessed that you cannot be a mate. This should be a wake up call to go back and think to what you did and what you can do better. If you never do that, you're going to have the very comfortable excuse of always, say, always saying, oh, the dudes, women friends on me because I'm too nice. Instead of realizing that maybe what you call being nice is actually you being a wimp and being a coward and not actually taking any risks, which lead to you never getting any gains. Because the friend zone is something that happens to every single male if you, if you wait long enough. If you are with a girl and there's that, that ambiguity and it eventually dies out and she thinks, okay, that guy is my friend, you're out of luck because now she sees you as a friend. And to go from friend to boyfriend is much tougher than to go from completely unknown stranger or acquaintance to boyfriend. The two are very different. So be careful with that. I'm going to take a quick break and come back. Yeah, so that's very important that you don't actually let yourself be put in the friend zone. It's better to be in no zone at all than to be in that. And this also leads to a tendency that women have of trying to keep you as a friend. And that is a frustration that I hear many men voice as well. Where they say, well, she doesn't want me as a boyfriend, but she'll keep me around as a friend to complain about all of the bad boys she dates. That's also your own fault. She said that she doesn't want you. And even if she lets it be known that maybe one day, there won't be a one day. So just cut the loss and, and leave. If what you want from that woman is romance, don't lie to yourself, okay? And don't be the type of guy that tries to sneak his way into a relationship. It never works. You're just going to end up hurting the woman. Because as I said, women don't date their friends. So be upfront and be honest with the people who want to date and be honest with yourself. Because if you don't, you're going to end up in the friend zone. And in the problem when you're in the friend zone is that you are pathetic. And women hate that. You know, many men think that masculinity is, is particularly allergic to weakness. And that is true. But I can tell you that femininity is even more so allergic to any signs of failure, of patheticness, or of weakness. They are just... Allergic. It's women can smell that they can smell desperations, frustrations, all of that, and it just throws them off completely. They detest it. And the best way for you to be lonely and single for the rest of your life is to be pathetic in the eyes of women because they will never give you a chance because you are just not suitable. Um, I don't know if it ever happened to you. It did for me when I was a teen. When a woman looks at you with those like, those pity filled eyes and she makes that noise like, ah, like you can pack your bags and leave. It's over. You will never get anything done with that woman ever. She had, she sees you as like a puppy. She sees you as like this helpless thing and it's not attractive at all. And she regards you as like a baby dog, but women don't date baby dogs. They date lions, wolves. So. It's never something that you want. Keep in mind that the reason why women tend to love having a gay best friend is because the gay best friend is a non-threat. They know that he's not attracted to them, they're not attracted to him. And on top of that, and that's 
a little bit uh, politically incorrect to say nowadays, but it's something I've always remarked. A lot of gay dudes tend to be very feminine, and because they're very feminine, they're very aligned and in tune with women, so they get along because they're very similar. But the problem is that, as I explained, what attracts women and men is that we're different than them. So if you become pathetic enough that the woman sees you as a best friend, she's seeing you basically as a woman with a dick. Like, n nothing is going to get done. You are basically... Your, your pe penis has disappeared in the ether. To her, you are a non-sexual being. Your sexuality is gone. And as I said, this means that the ambiguity and pressure is also gone, and therefore, there will be no relationships. So, resist the temptation of trying to win women over with pity. It simply doesn't function. And that also means that if you are not pathetic per se, you have to have something else to replace that. Uh, usually, being pathetic means that the woman knows everything about you, and she knows how you all react to certain things. And on top of that, she also knows that she has you under her grip because you won't go anywhere. That's something that is very dangerous. A lot of men give themselves entirely to the women that they want to date, thinking that by giving up their powers, they're going to eventually be rewarded. That never happens. When you give up your power to a woman, she punishes you instead because you are not worthy of respect in her eyes. So, a good thing that you can do, and it's something I described with the ambiguity, is to be mysterious. And by that, I don't mean to wear a black trench coat and to smoke cigarettes in the corner while looking at her like a creep. I mean that you don't want to reveal all of your cards at once. And you certainly don't want to let the woman think or believe that she understands you 100% because if that's the case, she will think she can control you 100%. So, when you actually discuss with the woman, when you get to know her better, don't say everything at once. Leave some spots of your personality in the dark. Make her come to you to discover them. And also, make it known, without even saying it, that you are not to be controlled, that you cannot be tamed. A large portion of the attraction that men feel towards women, uh, that women feel towards men, is that they see us again as foreign entities, just like we see them as that. But for them, it goes beyond that because there is an instinct in women to change men, and to change men, they need to understand us first. And the problem is that if you let a woman fulfill that fantasy, she will lose interest in you. It's the reason why, as I said again. Women love their gay best friends because there's nothing to discover. The guy is just like them. You need to be constantly rediscoverable by the woman. She needs to always be on her toes. She cannot grasp you 100% because if she does, the relationship is dead. This takes, of course, you knowing yourself because if you don't know yourself, you have really nothing to offer and there is no game involved. And that also leads to the ability to have enough of an identical, uh, I, I don't think that's possible to even use that as an adjective, but to have enough of a, an identity that you have a spine, that you exist as a whole being, and that is going to allow you also to move on and not insist if a woman rejects you. Many men who just hold onto the women that rejected them do so because they think that it's the one woman that is available and if they don't have this one, it's over. That is untrue. There are plenty of women out there. But if you think like this, every single new encounter with a woman is going to end the same way in you being rejected because you are desperate. And I discussed that in the NoFab video. Women can smell weakness, women can smell desperation, and they stay away from it. They stay away from weakness because women want strong partners they can count on. They stay away from desperation for a much more deeply rooted evolutionary reason that if you don't have the ability to get another girl and you are just all in for her, you think it's romantic because she's your only one and she's your onesies. She thinks you're pathetic because you can't get another girl. There is this weird balance that you have to entertain to be able to be attractive in women's eye that you need to at the same time be faithful to them and remain attractive enough that other women want you. 
it's something that is perfectly explicable because it means that you are high value, you, are very high, you have a very high value on the sexual, sexual market. And that is also something that is going to lead you to not waste your time with women who don't want you. Just move on because it's going to prepare you for success. And on top of that, like what a lot of men think, it's the best way to get a girl that rejected you. Uh, a lot of guys think that if they just keep on insisting and keep on asking a girl out, eventually she will say yes. It almost never happens. She will start to de detest you and maybe even fear you. But if you just accept the woman that rejected you and go do your own thing, she might come back. It has happened to me several times where, one, a woman shut me down and I just took it positively without being aggressive. And first off, it surprised her because many women are not used to that. They're used to men being very angry when they get rejected because they're not used to it. It hurts their ego. And second, uh, secondly, a lot of these women reached out to me afterwards, like two, two weeks later, because they thought, okay, you know what? Him taking it lightly and him not being angry is a sign that he has options and he's not bummed about losing me. So let me see if maybe I can give him another try. And that usually tends to lead to a chance at a relationship. So it both conserves your honor and your pride as a man, and it is much more effective. You also want to be funny. Now, when I say being funny, many men underestimate that characteristics in themselves because they overestimate other characteristics. And that is part of the project projection aspect I described. If you look at attraction through the lens of evolution, men and women are completely different, entirely different creatures. Men are mostly visual creatures, meaning that we look for markers of fertility in women and we are deeply attracted to that and only that. Men don't really care about status when it comes to money, about social standing that is completely useless in our eyes and it's been proven times and times again. It has been shown that women with very high status careers who make millions of dollars don't really have an advantage on the dating market compared to some chick who is just, I don't know, in college or a, bar, a, a barmaid. It doesn't make any difference. All that matters for women to attract a mate at first is to be attractive physically, that's it. But funnily enough, you see many men who project that onto women and, and say that, oh, women only care about looks. That's not true. Men only care about looks. We do that. Women care about status. It's entirely different. Look is one stratus of status, the only one that men care about. Women care about a whole lot. They care about height, facial features. They care about health markers. They care about social status when it comes to the, the community. They care about wealth, which is another type of, uh, of uh, social status. All of, that, all of these count, and they are not all equal, but they are more very interconnected with one another. And it's hard to say that one is more important than the rest. It really depends on the woman. There are certain women who will put a lot of weight and a lot of power in one of these categories. So some women are only going to be attracted to tall men because even though they don't realize it themselves, they have decided that the most important trait that they wish their partner to possess is height. Some women are like that with money, some with facial aesthetics. Some are attracted to things that are not really even visible. Like for example, stability. Maybe the guy is pudgy and he has a, the face of a troll, but he has a good stable job and he has a, a character, a personality that itself is dependable. And a woman can be very attracted to that because in her matrix, in her evolutionary matrix, it is the characteristics that she's seeking in a mate. So develop these characteristics as much as possible. Look max, train, get a good job, accumulate wealth for the sake of building a family, not for greed, and develop your personality. As I said, being funny is a marker of social hierarchy. It shows that within the community you have a weight. And it's interesting too because, as I said, many men underestimate it. And yet, 
if you have paid attention, you should know how important it truly is when you have the ability to make a woman laugh because it taps deep down into, again, the, the entire matrix. It's something that is like a superpower in a sense where because you are able to make her and other people laugh, in a sense, you are able to make the community and the people around you in your social settings to regard you in a positive light because you're constantly able to have an influence on their mood. And that is extremely attractive for women. The opposite is not true. Meaning that for a lot of men, having a girlfriend that's funny or not doesn't matter. It's a plus, but I've never met a guy who told me that what he's looking for in a mate is that she's funny. It's also the reason why, by the way, men to be more funny than women is because it's a skill that we have to develop. It's not necessarily biological, but it's something we need to survive. If you're not funny as a man, you would have a tough time growing up because you could get bullied. You wouldn't have the, the upper hand in certain situations. So it's something that was needed. And it's something to keep in mind too, because evolutionary preferences and the differences between men and women are such that it can be a little bit tough for men to wrap their heads around it and therefore to actually adapt properly. Too many men are going to look max to the top of their capacities and they'll look very pretty, but they'll still have no success with women because they completely ignore the other aspects that might, as, might be more important. Many men hate when you tell them that, but it's the truth that confidence and being yourself are some of the most important traits a man can have. You can be a gorgeous babe if you're completely incapable of talking to a woman and you have the uh, personality of a clam, you're not going to be very successful with women. So develop that. It's cliche to say, but the men that I know that are the most successful with women, that had the most beautiful girlfriends, are not good looking, but they're very funny and they're very charismatic. And these were always things that drew women to them and then kept women around them. So develop that as much as possible. And that's the social status aspect I was talking about. Social status is important as well because if you have a girlfriend or a wife, you will have realized that they are community oriented. Men are much more individual in their way of thinking. And therefore, the way you are going to integrate within the community, where, wherever you are, is very important. When you're in a social setting, girls look at the way you interact, not just with them, but with others. And they pay attention, right? Women are astute observers of that type of stuff. If they perceive you to be ostracized, they're not going to want you. Because if they were to pick you as a mate, and then you start a family, and you need help one day, but no one likes you, well, it's not going to be good for the sake of the family. So, you are going to be avoided like the plague. And to, have, to get people to like you is a different story altogether, but it starts with confidence, the confidence that you are worthy of something, you are worthy of finding someone, and that is going to open up options that are going to reinforce your confidence, all of which is going to make you a more comfortable, a more charismatic person. And that also will make you fun. Women like fun. And by fun, it doesn't necessarily mean going out all the time. For me, for example, I'm a monk. I never go out. But I, I still retain some aspects of my personality who are fun. You need to entertain your woman. Some men, you plug them in a relationship. And if everything stays the same until the end of time, they'll be good with that. Because men are stabilizers. We stabilize. We like everything ordered and stable. Women bring chaos into that, chaos which helps us restructure that order and make something better out of it. If you never allow that, or if you yourself are so orderly that there's nothing, anything fun that erupts, well, women are not going to be very interested in dating you. And as I said again, it doesn't mean that you have to be an, in an extrovert or be extremely flashy or flamboyant, but it means that some aspects of your personality are going to need to entice the girl. And if you have zero aspects like this, well, guess what? You will get zero girls. And when it comes to being enticing, you also have to be 
sexual and that is key and misinterpreted at the same time because what I mean by this is that you have to be aware of your sexuality and you have to not be afraid of letting it show while keeping it under control. A lot of men end up being labeled as creepy because they are extremely sexual in their demeanor and their actions but it's not under control and therefore it just appears dangerous in the, the eyes of women. Non-controlled sex drive is very dangerous for the survival of women because they end up being the one victimized by the men who cannot control themselves. So they also have a very strong instinct when it comes to that. It's the reason why, uh, if you're interested, look up studies where women deem certain men as creepy and then listen to the reasons they give. It usually is not tangible. It's a vibe. It's a certain energy that they feel in you where they think, okay, you're a menace. That is when you take it to the extreme. But if you take it to the other extreme and you're not sexual at all, she's going to see you as her gay best friend and you also have no chance. So you need to be in the middle. You need to be somewhat of a threat, but nothing dangerous. It needs to be exciting. She needs to think that something could happen. Who knows? Maybe you're going to kiss her. She, won't, she doesn't have the ability to guess what you're going to do next. And that is what is keeping her interested. And in this day and age, even talking about sexual relationships or, uh, or uh, attraction in these terms is seen as a little bit taboo because we live in the age of consent. Consent is a great thing, but you will find that consent is rarely verbal. It tends to be a, a form of body language, meaning that for me, for example, I have never in my entire life asked a woman if I could kiss her, if I could grab her ass, if I could have sex with her, if I could do anything in bed with her, I mean, I just do it. And I never had any problems because I pay attention to the gesture and the way the woman is, right? Unless you treat women like objects and you don't care, in which case you're going to get in trouble because you will violate their consent. If you just pay attention, you can tell when a woman wants you to kiss her. You can tell if a woman is okay with what's happening in bed. All of that is, is seamless in a sense. We've always done it without talking to each other. But this new age of hyper-consent, in a sense, is killing romance because it's killing that tension and danger that women like. And they don't even realize it themselves, but they're destroying their own sex drive because they are, they are in a sense, trading their sexual freedom for security. And the problem is that once they give up that freedom, well, they don't have sexualities anymore because what they used to like is gone. So... It's your job to just make sure it doesn't happen because I can tell you that the best way to kill the vibe uh, if there's a kiss that is going to happen between you and a woman is to ask if you can kiss her. Like all of the desire, all of the lust in her eyes are going to disappear because you just went in her eyes through potential sexual mate, potential predator that was going to ravish her to a little boy that has to ask mommy for a kiss on the cheek. It's, it's, a, it's a lady boner killer. It's, it will completely destroy her mood. It, there's a chance she will say no, but she would have said yes if you just went in for the kiss. This is not violating consent. It's actually giving women the ability to retract consent if they wish. If you ask, you're not giving her a choice. It's a bit paradoxical, but by asking, you are forcing her to say no. It's another part of women that is really discussed, but as I said... Men are seen as slayers if they have many conquests and women are the opposite. So there is a social stigma around women accepting their sexuality, especially when it comes to choices. If you ask a woman, hey, do you want to kiss me? Now you're putting the honors and the responsibility of the kiss on her. And if she says yes, it means that she wanted it. So she in a sense instigated a lot of women are never, want, never going to want to do that. They always want the man to take full responsibility. This puts us in a lot of danger nowadays, but sadly, it's never going to go away. It's either you accept that danger and you take the risk, or you don't take the risk and nothing happens. It's up to you to decide. And this might contradict what I just said, but I would also want you to take your time before sex. Because many women nowadays 
see sex as something that they give to the man as a reward, which is incredibly insulting and damaging for sexual relationships between the genders, because it means that it's a power that women hold over men's heads, like a, like a true toy, and we're supposed to like make tr do tricks to get it. And you see that especially with the younger generations of sims and all of that subculture and reality of men who are so desperate to have an actual attempt at getting women that they're willing to do whatever, and it leads to a gener generation of women who are incredibly spoiled and for, we for whose power has become so important in their life and the ability they have to control men has taken so much space in their lives that it's the only way they know how to function. Like their one personality is that they are attractive and they can control men and that's it. And both sides of the spectrum is pathetic. The men that are always controlled by women and the women that just control men all day long are both ridiculously sad individuals. You don't want to become like that. So, to do that, you need to take away that power. And the only way to do that is self-control. Because, of course, women are, in a sense, the guardians of sex. She's the one who decides if you have sex or not. If it was up to men to decide when we have sex, we would have sex 15 times a day, every day of the year. The balance between masculine sex drive and feminine sex drive is incredibly important for the survival of the species, one, but also for balanced relationships. You need to be met in the middle here, right? If you only had sex whenever the woman wants, it wouldn't work. And if you only had sex whenever the man wants, it wouldn't work. There is an in-between to be met. And you will find that this in-between is extremely easy to strike once you're in a relationship. But outside of the relationship, once you're getting started with the person, it's not as easy. So, my advice to you as a man is that since you're going to want sex much more than your partner, most likely, or future girlfriend, it's going to take some work on your hand to regulate that so as to not become a complete slave to the pussy, in a sense. And the best way to do that is to slow down sex. And by that, I mean that you don't want to rush it. You're going to have sex with that person eventually. So, Take your time. You will find that this tends to drive some women insane because they have sort of accepted that their only value is sex, is their ability to be fucked. And so when you take that away from her, it might make them a little bit upset at first, but you will also, in a sense, resent to them. They're going to be able to approach relationship with a healthier approach. They will start to de-objectify themselves, which will also allow them to be proper women for you because, as I said, the type of women that think that they are only worth so much as their asses tend to be nightmares to date. A woman is much more dangerous than that. So, take your time before the first sexual intercourse with the person, knowing also, as I said previously, that sex is an emotional bond that is being created. It is not just physical. Sex is not just an exchange of fluids that is true for animals, but not for us. We sacralized sex, and that is a good thing. The modern age is slowly starting to desacralize it and it's leading to all of the problems we see nowadays with men's se uh, masculine sexuality, for example. And that also will mean that you're going to connect emotionally with your woman. Now, as I said, masculine and feminine sex drives are not the same way, they're not the same thing. We're attracted by different things and we have sex for different reasons. The reasons for why we have sex are both valid, meaning that it's more primal and it's more biological for men and it's more psychological and cultural for women. You will find that if you discuss with a woman, your girlfriend or your wife, what she feels towards sex and what excites her, you will see that it's completely different than from us. For us, we are, as I said, visual creatures. So visual stimulus is enough to get us going. Most dudes, uh, they, their girlfriend can just grab their dick and that's it, they're ready to go. You don't need to work. If you have ever had sex with a girl, you know that it's not that easy. They need to be put in the mood with different methods. And these methods show one thing, is that they have a much more emotional connection to sex, which is also the reason why a lot of the new feminist movements are trying to remove that from sexuality, because... It's what is making fe female sexuality balanced. It's the fact that it mostly is conveyed through emotion. And 
trying to have women to have sex the way men have sex is cruel, but it's what's happening nowadays. Or you have a push for more open sexualities for women, for more partners, for less actual connections. And in a sense, it's turning women into men. But the problem is that even for men, that model doesn't work. So it especially doesn't work for women. If you want a balanced relationship, you're going to have to shove all of that nonsense away and follow her lead if she is herself balanced. Meaning that if she has, if she has a more calculated approach to sex, a more emotional approach to sex, follow her lead because it's going to allow you to balance how you feel biologically. You will always be super attracted to her, always. That's always going to be a thing. But try to convey that attraction and make it appear on the other side when it materializes into sex, into a shape that is closer to what she desires. It doesn't mean that you need to completely, you know, give up your own sexuality, but understand that female sexuality, at least the way it used to be, is more sustainable and is the reason why families and the, the nuclear family tends to shape itself around it. It's the reason why we are not following the model of men just going from women to women and having sex to have as many offspring as possible. The entirety of marriage and of heterosexual relationships, at least in the West, is, uh, is a geocentric. It's centered around sexual uh, sexuality, uh, sexual sexuality, no, uh, female sexuality, and that is a good thing, but I will get back to that. Because now I give you enough pointers to understand if you're ready to find a girl and to remediate if not, where to find a girl and then how to approach her, the traits that you want to actually uh, exude, etc, etc. That is the easy part, actually. Getting a girlfriend is the easy part of the equation because after that, you have to keep her. You have to have the ability to keep your girl. And that is easier said than done because many men have the ability to find girlfriends, but they don't have the ability to retain them. And as I said, since the goal is to actually create a strong relationship that is going to lead to something that is going to lead to creation, creating a family, you better be able to keep your girl. So now we're going to start about how to keep your relationship healthy. Since both the masculine and the feminine attract each other, it also means that deep down they reject each other. We're like opposite magnets, right? There is some problems in that, meaning that it's going to mean that the person you date, because they're the opposite gender, is going to be a bit of an enigma. And as I said, women like that in men. And men like that in women. But there are also portions of that mystery that we hate, that annoy us. And it, always it is always interesting to look from the viewpoint of people who hate women because you quickly find out that what they hate is not a specific woman in particular, it's their characteristics as a whole. Which is why women haters tend to really be haters of the entire gender and vice versa, men haters tend to hate men, like, across the board with no distinctions. It's the reason why the not all men think is nonsense, because it is all men. In their eyes, in the eyes of men haters, it is all men. And in the eyes of incels, it is all women. Because there is a certain truth in it, that there are certain traits about women that are very aggravating when you're a male because they are just in direct opposi opposition with who you are. A good way to go above that and to not be too, too worried or bothered about it is to think and project yourself and put yourself in their shoes and understand that if it's true for us, it's true for them. There are things that we do and we say and we are that women detest. But these need to be maintained. Paradoxically, again, just like you don't want to make men and women similar, you don't want to let go of everything the other gender doesn't like because by doing so, you're also going to get rid of what they do like. And we're seeing that more and more with men becoming more feminized and women having less and less of an interest in men is because even though we're getting rid of what they didn't like, we're also getting rid of what they like. 
And I have a video on the topic that is going to come out next week about toxic masculinity, but it really is the reason why this concept is so stupid is because women love toxic masculinity. And the best example I can give you of that is if you have a girlfriend one day, if you have one right now or your wife, or whatever, if you're on the streets together and some guy, I don't know, grabs her ass or calls her a slut and you, and you just dog the guy in the face, after you punch the guy, turn and look at your girl and look at her eyes. You will see something in her eyes that is going to closely resemble lust, but it's not quite lust. It's biological desire because you just proved that you have the ability to protect her and that is incredibly attractive for women. Uh, for this video, actually, I quizzed some friends of mine and I told them what could be the hardest thing a guy could do in front of you to make him immediately attractive. And a lot of them told me to fight, right? If they see a guy fight, that immediately heightens their, his status in their eyes and makes them much more attractive. Some women refuse to admit that, but this is, in a sense, a form of toxic masculinity. It's violence. It's violence put at their services. As long as it's for their benefit, they love it. And I have my own personal experience on the matter because I've dated many women in the past who would be described as feminists and socialists or whatever you want to call them, who also paradoxically only liked very macho and very masculine men. It's the only, only type of men they liked. But at the same time, they were constantly criticizing toxic masculinity. And there is a schizophrenia in that, in reality. They come after what they like most. And these were women who liked to be dominated, who wanted to be submissive. But at the same time, they pushed for an ideology that was the exact opposite of that. And the problem is that they're creating their own misery, in a sense. They don't see that, but you should be able to see that. So, because that is the case, you want to embody the masculine traits that you have and just be yourself, because understand that these are the traits that are going to make you attractive. Heterosexual women like men. What is a man? It's someone with masculine traits, be it biological or cultural and behavioral. So, be a man. That's the first step to actually keeping your woman. Understand that since masculinity and femininity both attract and reject each other, when they are put together in close quarters for a long time, they have an influence on one another. It's like a chemical reaction. So your masculinity is going to infect her femininity and vice versa. The issue is that I have found that nowadays, because the society is becoming more and more skewed towards women, well, femininity has a stronger and stronger ability to infect masculinity. So unlike what many people say, and maybe something that I've said and you misinterpreted, when I say that men are more like women and women are more like men, it's true, but it's mostly skewed towards men, meaning that it's not really women that are being more masculine. Women are just as feminine as they always were. It's men that are less masculine and becoming more feminine. So the balance of masculinity and femininity in the world is starting to be skewed. And the problem is that every time there is an imbalance, it tends to be bad. I think that some men would disagree and say that it's good to have a ton of masculinity and no femininity. I would personally disagree. This is the point when, t when uh, I out myself as a feminist. I personally like the fact that women get to choose their career, they get to choose their partner. To me, it's actually good, even from an evolutionary standpoint, because it is leading us towards a deeper degree of development as a species. But... What the society has made of it is the problem because all of these were good things. For example, women being able to find their mate and pick their mate themselves. But because it's taking place in an hypersexualized society, it led to hypergamy. So likewise, the ability of women to work and not depend on the men were a good thing until it led to inflation and the destruction of the family because nowadays there is no incentive for a woman to get a man. That is the true problem. The true problem is not in the evolution of the biological. It's what the cultural has done to it afterwards. This discussion on cultural and biological could go on forever because in reality, the more you dig, the more you realize that it's just really interactions between the two that go back thousands and thousands of years. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that. But 
as I said, there is a lack of masculinity in the wood and therefore masculine men are going to be in very high demand. It's something I'm already noticing. When I go out in public, I look at dudes who don't really look like men. Then I look at the women and I look at the way the women look at me and I'm like, okay, for me, I'm taken, so it doesn't matter to me. But for any dude that wonders what it takes to get a girl and then to keep her, it's simple. Be a man. Just by being a man and being muscular and being confident, you're already above 90% of guys. You're better than them. So you're going to have a much stronger chance of scoring. And this is going to lead to the main metaphor I'm going to share with you guys today. And it's a metaphor that I've refined in my brains and that I like to use because it really helps me grasp concepts such as masculinity and femininity that can be a little bit vague and tough to nuance. But for me, the second I picture them in my head with these concepts and with these allegorical representations, it makes it clearer. And so, because this video really hinges on the difference between the masculine and the feminine, I want to share that metaphor with you. So, the way I want you to think about men and women is in these terms. Women are like the sea. Men are like mountains. Think of the characteristics of both of these elements. What is the sea? The sea is unstable. The sea is unpredictable. But the sea is also, in a sense, predictable in its tendency to constantly repeat what it seeks, which is the creation of waves and just the development and the sprawling of its own energy. What is a mountain? A mountain is more stoic, it is much more stable, therefore also in a sense predictable, and it is in direct opposition with the sea. So if we're going to take those two energies and we put them together in the same vacuum, you have the sea and you have the mountains, and the sea constantly crashes against the mountains. That is the relationship between femininity and masculinity. It has always been like this. Unlike what you might think, the energy that is the most proactive within the relationship is always the feminine one. It doesn't mean that it's the one driving the relationship or that it's the one that outside of it is making the most difference in the world. But when you talk about men and women, it is the case. And so if we think like this, we can also understand women to a much deeper level because many men are going to have problems with their girl, with their wife, because they just don't get what they are. They don't understand where this energy or these behaviors come from. And therefore, they start to resent them because it's tough to feel love or acceptance towards something that you don't understand. So let me explain to you why women are like the sea. The sea is relentless. And the goal of the sea is to ship away at the mountain. It constantly comes and the wave crash against the mountain, taking away pebbles here or pebble there until the mountain is completely crumbled and destroyed. The energy of chaos can be found in femininity in that aspect. And it can be difficult to deal with if you're the mountain because you're just there minding your own business and you have that energy that constantly crashes into you. It's what leads many men to consider their wives or girlfriends as nag and they start to resent, it, resent them for it because they don't understand what it is. What it is is simple. Women want movement. Women, women cannot tolerate stagnation. It's the reason why a large portion of evolution was driven by women. They are the ones who are constantly trying to refine and they dislike uh, immobility. They just simply don't like it. For a more practical example, some guys are going to say, well, I don't understand when I watch like a basketball match, my wife gets upset. Why does she get upset? Is she upset because you're watching a football match or basketball match for two hours? No, it's because you're not doing anything productive. That's what pisses her off. And she might be in the wrong. Maybe you're just resting, but it's not what she understands on a biological level. What she sees on that biological level is that you are not moving. And because you're not moving, you're going to stagnate. And for her, it's dangerous because 
if you go back to the essence of what a woman is and what she will actually seek in a mate, what they seek in mates is the ability to provide. To provide with what? Resources. To do what? To create a family and sustain it. So, if you're not doing anything, it looks to her as if you are not willing to provide and that is a bad sign. And therefore, she's trying to kill that in the egg and she's going to be annoying on purpose to get you to move. It's not an attack towards who you are. Again, the waves crashing against the mountain are not trying to kill the mountain. It's just what they do. And this is very sexist, right? Many people would say that this is incredibly sexist because it's, it's basically, in a sense, presenting women as creatures who don't control themselves. And that is exactly what I'm saying. Just like I'm saying that men don't control many of their biological drives because these are so deeply rooted in our DNAs that most of us don't even get it. But they always make it into cultural standards. It's the reason why you have the stereotype of the nagging woman and you never hear the opposite. Men rarely nag people. Or if they do, it tends to be seen as a feminine trait because it is. That's what women do. Women are like the sheep. But it also means that what is going to matter the most for you as the mountain is your ability to remain a mountain. Many men, when they get nagged like this, they have one or two reactions. They either give up, so they just do whatever their wife said, or they resist aggressively. But that is not the nature of the mountain. The mountain is not aggressive. The mountain doesn't get pissed off at the sea. The mountain just stays a mountain. It stays stoic. And that is exactly what your woman wants. And I know it's tough to grasp, and for a lot of guys, they're not going to get it. But it's a challenge, in a sense. It's a... It's a, a, a it's your girl trying to see how resistant you are to, your, to her assaults and if you're going to actually snap and if you're actually going to give her the reaction that she wants, which is the worst, worst thing that you could do. The two options I gave you are the worst that you can do because women are looking for stability and stability includes the ability to control your emotions. It's the reason why emotional instability is mostly linked to Women. Women are seen as more emotionally unstable because they simply are. It doesn't mean that they are weaker. It just means that the way they deal with their emotions is different than us. If you start getting swept into the, into the way your woman deals with her emotions, you're both going to be unstable and it's not going to work. The relationship needs someone stable and unstable. And this also means that if we look at it in terms of energies and not genders, it could be that in your relationship, you are a woman and you are the stable one and your man is the unstable one. It is fairly possible. Maybe you're even gay and you are the stable one and your boyfriend is the unstable one. That's possible. It's because femininity and masculinity are not intrinsically linked to gender. They are mostly linked to it, but not all the way. I say that to make you understand that the metaphor is just that. It's a metaphor. As I said, if you want to understand women, you need to understand women in terms of poesy because if you don't, you're going to start resenting what they are. If you cannot see the beauty in women's behaviors, you're going to start to regret it. And the only way to understand it and to actually see it through a proper lens is through the lens of art. It's the reason why I think that a good method to actually save men who have started to develop a hatred for women would be to expose them to pieces of art that depict femininity, like paintings, for example, or like even classical music, all of that can give you a deeper understanding of what women are. And unlike what you might think, when you understand what a woman is, you start understanding why she does certain things. And since they make sense, you're going to accept them with more ease. As the mountain, as I said, your only way to face the sea is going to set up boundaries. That's what the mountain does. It creates a strong boundary. That boundary is everything. In a relationship, you are going to set boundaries that cannot be broken. And I insist on this. They cannot be broken. If the mountain allows the boundaries to break, what happens? It crumbles into the sea. Crumbling into the sea means that the relationship is going to die. I'm going to explain to you exactly why, but in this sense, you cannot allow your boundaries to be negotiated with, because as I said, what women do is they change men for better or for worse. 
as I said, the best relationship is a woman that allows you to better yourself. But the woman will just change you. It's, it's a neutral energy. Some women are able, and are very rare, to only change a man positively, but they are, they are almost non-existent. Most women just will change men, and then wherever the guy goes, good or bad, it doesn't really matter. He'll just be changed. It means that it's up to you to control the change. So she will be the vector of it, and you will be the conveyor. She will be the energy that pushes and promotes change, and you will take just enough of that energy to guide yourself in the direction you want to go. And what you want to do is you want to go up. You want to better yourself. So your boundaries are not walls. Okay, just like the mountain is not completely impermeable to the seawater. It lets through just enough so that it can seep into itself, then get collected, and then feed the plants on the mountains. You will have to harness the feminine energy of your partner, just like it will have to harness the masculine energy. It's a relationship that in reality is like crisscross like this, and then goes up. It's like a, a pillar of energy that then leaves the tree of life when you eventually have children. But if you refuse that altogether, and you either fail to put up boundaries or they are too strict, you're going to miss the point entirely. You cannot, you cannot put such strict boundaries in place that your woman stops to challenge them. It's not possible and it's not even healthy because it's in their nature to try to constantly change things. I've expressed that. They have the responsibility to push men to be their best self and men who don't realize that as going, are going to become worse as a response because they think that they're just being attacked. You're not being attacked. You're being tested. Women constantly test men. And that is proven by the fact that many red pill websites have a certain name that they give to that type of nagging and they call it a shit test. What is a shit test? A shit test is a moment in your life, in your day, where for some reason or another, your girl is going to start a fight, or she's going to start an argument, or she's going to say something that bothers you or annoys you. And it truly is a good demonstration of how these men think about women when you see the semantics they use. A shit test, it's something negative, right? It's something that is associated with fecal matters. It cannot be positive. And yet, they are. Shit tests are extremely positive because they are a challenge. A challenge is never negative. It only is if you're not prepared or if you fail. In which case, both ways show that you are at fault. It's not your fault. She just challenged you. You weren't able to actually fulfill the challenge because you weren't actually prepared. So, see those shit tests as what they are. It's like evolution knocking on your door and saying, hey, or just making sure that you're a good mate. That's essentially what it is. All shit tests can be linked to that. Women don't start arguments with their men just for the sake of it because they're bored. They don't realize it themselves, but there's a little voice in them that says, hey, it's been a while since we actually shook the dude. Let's see what he's made of. Let's see if the mountain is still a mountain and it's not turning into cardboard. So the waves are going to hit the mountain again, again, and again. And if you're malleable, it's going to eventually be the end of you. Because, as I said, the energy of the sea, the energy of women, is boundless. It is actually impressive how, how easily it can just go on forever and ever. If you ever try to argue with a woman, they do what I call spiral arguing. Meaning that it's like you're going in circles. You go nowhere. You know why you go nowhere? Because there's no reason for the argument. She's not starting the argument to get an answer or a response. She's starting an argument to test you. Any man that has a, a, a steady relationship will tell you that women don't really like answers and they don't really like solutions. If your girl comes home upset from work and she says, oh, I have to talk to you about something and she talks about her problems, the worst thing you can do is give her solutions. She doesn't want solutions. She's a grown woman. She can handle them, them herself. What she wants is you to, for you to listen that's all she wants. Just like when the sea and the waves crash on the mountains, the sea is not waiting for the mountain to do anything. It, you just have to stand there. Literally, to be a man, a large portion of it is just stand. And some people will tell me, well, that's your cock. 
because you're just letting her do whatever. I'm not saying to let her run all over you. I'm saying to not give her the reaction that you think is going to save you because it won't. Again, it's like men who try to be logical with women when you argue. Women don't argue logically. It doesn't mean that women are not capable of logic, but when they argue, it's purely emotional and it's purely based on what they are as creatures. So there is absolutely no point in getting riled up by these shit tests because it means that you failed the test. But the worst thing you can do, much worse than getting upset at a woman rowdy, is to give in because men who get upset are men who don't understand what I just shared. They don't understand that a shit test is a good thing. It's just a proof that your woman is invested. It's a proof that she is still in the relationship and willing to build something because she's testing it, right? It's like she's testing the foundations of the building. The day she stopped testing means that she doesn't really give a fuck about the building anymore. It can fall apart. It's not her problem. So she tests you and you resist. You never give in. Because if you give in, it's the end of the relationship. I told you before that women hate weakness, women hate pathetic men, and women also don't like men who give up. So if the first two are going to be obstacles to you getting a girl, the third is going to be an obstacle to you keeping a girl. Because if you give in, you have failed as a mountain. You are not a rock anymore. You are something else. You are you're sand. And the problem is that is that because you are now sand, you offer no resistance. Women love movement, and movement also includes the idea of resistance. If you cannot provide one or the other, it's over. And uh, to continue the metaphor, for example, if you look at the sea when it crash crashes on the beach, where are the waves? Where are the explosions of water? Where is the explosion of life? When there are rocks, when there is something for the waves to actually hit, what happens if the wave just hits the beach? It just covers it. And that is the perfect allegorical representation of what happens to a man when he starts to give in to shit tests and to nagging and to women's demands. So when you start giving up, you're going to be submerged. Actually, Bill Burr has a very good uh, metaphor about that that is also linked to the sea, where he describes it also as like waves hitting the beach and one day you just wake up and you're the, in the middle of a lagoon, like the tiny rock that is somehow managed to make it, and the sea is all over you and your life is over because you got taken over by the feminine energy. And therefore you have failed as a male, as a, as a rock, as the mountain, you have failed. Just like the sea is supposed to be where life is teeming, where life was created, you are supposed to be the place that allows life to anchor itself. And that means stability. If you just fall apart when the sea hits you once or twice, guess what? There's not going to be much life here, right? The sediments that you would have given to the sea to then give birth to life are never going to actually be able to materialize because you just got completely melted by the sea and that needs to be avoided. You are supposed to be a, a rock, not an iceberg. You're not supposed to melt. You're supposed to be there forever. And the reason why you want to do that is not just for yourself and for your own self-respect, and not even for the relationship, but also for your woman. Because, unlike what you might think, a woman whose man gives up to her shit test is a woman who is miserable. Completely paradoxical. Again, you might tell me, well, that makes no sense. She's the one bothering me all the time, and I finally give up, and now she hates me? What the fuck? Well, it's because you don't get women. You don't understand women. Just because you gave her what she wanted doesn't mean that it's going to make her happy because women, just like men, don't know what they want. It's the reason why you never take advice on how to actually talk or approach or interact with women from women because they don't know at all. And even if they were to know, they would never be honest with you. So instead, listen to wisdom, the wisdom of nature. I think there's a reason why masculinity has always been depicted as earth and femininity has always been depicted as water it's because it makes sense the two together make sense so what happens to the sea when it meets no resistance with the rock well nothing happens because the confrontation of the two was the relationship now there's no confrontation you are the beach both literally and figuratively b-i-t-c-h 
and you're now being covered by the sea, it has complete rain over you, you're sand, so you're smooth and soft, and you offer no resistance, and now she's bored, and not only is she bored, she hates your fucking guts, and I know women like this, usually they tend to be in their 40s and 50s, And that with a guy that gave up at some point, he couldn't take it anymore. And now they, they just hate him. Like with everything in them, they, they detest the guy. And you can see it in the way they interact. Well, the guy is completely apathic. Apathic? Yeah, apathic. And she's just vile towards him. It's a relationship between a cock and a witch. And that, of course, doesn't function because the resistance is not there anymore. Therefore, you are not really a partner for the woman anymore. She's stuck with like a weird, overgrown child. And no woman desires that. Because it means that you gave up. And if you gave up, it means that you don't really care about the relationship anymore. So you don't really care about her. What I'm saying right now, if you're a woman, take note. Because I might be saving your marriage in 15 or 20 years. Many women don't realize that they create their own misery. They don't realize it because they don't even understand where their biological urge for movement comes from. Men certainly don't get it either. So it's two people who don't get what's going on and then the relationship just goes to shit and they think, oh, it's because marriage sucks. No, it's because you suck. It's because you never actually took the time to sit down and think about these things from an evolutionary standpoint. But the second you understand it the way I just told you, it makes total sense. So, to not kill your relationship and not kill the respect that your woman has for you, you need to resist. This doesn't mean that it must be a constant fight between you and your lady, but there must be something, there must be some resistance. An example from my relationship, my girl often tells me that I drive her crazy because I'm very stubborn, meaning that I put up a fight, I argue with her. But I argue in the sense that I refuse to budge. I don't engage with her in the spiral arguments. I just say no. And that's it. It's a strict boundary. It means also that, again, I'm interesting because I'm not easily, completely uh, invaded in a sense or, or surpassed. And I can tell you that when she tells me that and she says, oh, you drive me crazy, she says it with a smile on her face because it's a good thing. And this is my advice to you. When your girl wants something or says something and she wants you to do something and she wants movement, don't shut down that. That's great. It means that you have a top-notch woman. She's fulfilling her evolutionary purpose on this planet. She's getting you to move. Okay. What you want to do, however, is then to use your best judgment and say yes to certain things and no to other things. And when you say no, she will get upset. Just like the sea hitting the rocks is going to scream and explode in fuses because it wants to get its way, but it's not always getting its way, and that is a good thing. I can tell you, and you will notice yourself if you apply my advice, that when you say no to your girl, she's going to be pissed for maybe five minutes, and then she's going to start to have a smile on her face because deep down, unconsciously, you passed the test. You passed the shit test. You resisted. And even though she was upset at first, she will eventually be more happy than she was before the test. Every single test is like a new step that you climb. And that step is basically the mental representation she has of you in her head. If you fail the test, you're going down the stairs to the point where you're going to eventually be at the bottom in the cave and she hates you now. Every test you pass is the opposite. You, you shine in her eyes. You have more value in her eyes. Because you're fulfilling your role as the mountain. And why do women do that? What exactly is the point of testing you all the time? Is it for their own selfish satisfaction? No, it's for the family. It's for the, the, the nuclear entity you're going to create. She's testing your solidity. She's making sure you can take it. You can take challenges. Because the shit tests that you get from your women are like one-tenth of what real life is going to throw your way. So if you cannot pass them and resist them, guess what? She knows you're not going to be up to snuff when real life hits, when challenges hit, and therefore you're not going to be a good mate. So embrace those tests and pass them. They're actually very easy. You don't want to give in. You want to be a rock or she's going to be miserable. 
And therefore, being a doormat is the worst thing you can do in your relationship, something that should be evident to any man that respects themselves and respects their women. Too many people see that as machismo of saying, oh, you say no and like you put up boundaries and uh, it's sexist. It's not sexist. What is sexist actually and very misogynistic is to allow your woman to run all over you because then it's making her sad. It's killing the relationship because she's not getting what she wants because she gets what she wants. I hope that you understand that point. So, as I was saying, not being a doormat is incredibly important to keep the relationship going because if you look at the sea as something that constantly wants movement, what provides stability to that sea is the rock. But more importantly, what guides the energy of the sea is also the rock. The rock divides the waves and it pushes the current one way or the other. If there is no rock, yes, the sea is free to do whatever it wants, but it was never what women intended. They don't want that. They want to have a partner. A partner is someone who opposes their energy with yours. And this goes and leads down a path of in all the sociological development that escapes many people and that maybe I'm going to make some of you mad, but it needs to be said. A lot of the time when women misbehave, when women don't do the things they're supposed to do, when they stop being proper and uh, usually that leads them to being miserable, it's men's fault, right? It started as men not capable of fulfilling their end of the bargain and women also saying fuck it at some point and just giving up. A large portion of feminism can be linked and traced to that. Too many men like to blame feminism for women not being proper women anymore and they're not being any good girls. The reason why they started is because men also were starting to stop being men. They started to just not want to fulfill any personal responsibilities. They relinquished their paternal duties and that led to a reaction. We exist in an environment where masculine and feminine energy cohabit one another, meaning that it's foolish to think that one can go astray and the other can have no influence. If the sea is polluted, there's a chance that it's because there was some problem with the mountain at some point. There is some pollutants that seeped within the rock of the mountain and contaminated the sea and vice versa. And playing the blame game and trying to find whose fault is it serves no one, by the way. It's what feminists, it's what men going their own way do. All they spend their energy on is pointing the finger and saying, oh, it's women's fault for this and it's men's fault for that. Because they have a segregated view of what it, what it means to be a man and a woman in the sense that they don't see these two energies as complementary. They absolutely are. And because they complement each other by default, it means also that they are different in nature. So you want to resist. You want to keep a very strong identity. The identity your woman found you with. Keep in mind, she selected you for a reason. Even though it feels like she wants you to change. It is true, but not in absolute terms, because if she wanted you to change who you are completely, she wouldn't have picked you in the first place. So be very confident in her ability to make a choice and stay who you are. Be, in a sense, stable. You can change some aspects of your personality, but if you change them all, guess what is going to happen? She's going to start hating you because you're not the person that she picked when you first got started. It's something you hear a lot with people who say, oh, they changed. Well, sometimes they did change, but it's because they thought it was to the benefit of the relationship. Like, for example, if you give up and you let those shit tests get to you and you let your woman slowly erode your personality. Even though it will make her miserable, she will never get to the point where she will be able to realize that before it's too late so it is your role as the male and as the rock to do that, to prevent that from doing it, but also to not develop resentment because at the end of the day, the sea is going to do what the sea does and the rock is going to do what it does. 
If your woman starts to hate you because you're inflexible, that is going to be a problem as well. So the two sides need to work on it, but you only have an impact on your own self. And when it comes to not letting yourself go, it's true for identity, it's also true for principles. For many men, a challenge they're going to be facing in this modern age is that most likely, your woman will not only be different from you from a personality standpoint, she will also be different from you from a sociological and political standpoint. And many men see that as an impossibility. They think, oh, I can never be with a woman who's not conservative. Well, you're sort of out of luck because within themselves, deep down, the nature of women is more liberal, it is more progressive, and men are more conservative by nature. And I really insist on the by nature, this is biological. It would be too long to explain why, maybe I'll find an excuse one day to make a video about the topic, but it's the reason why you see so many women who are liberal and so many men who are right-wing. It's not a fluke, it's because it aligns with who we are inside, as creatures, as beasts. And therefore, if you think that you can only be with someone who is exactly the same as you, one, you have been fed the propaganda that the only type of people you can build a life with are people who are exactly like you, which is a lie. And two, you also are, in a sense, sabotaging yourself. And also, you don't trust yourself because... You should be confident enough that you can find a woman that if she has une tête bien faite, a head well made, as we say in French, she will see the light. If you truly believe that your opinions are the correct ones, well, at some point, surely she will also see that, right? If you're not capable of doing that and of therefore helping her because you would make her see the truth, then just don't even start in the first place. It's important to be able to understand that because <clears throat> as you will go into it, it will be tougher and tougher and tougher to not let yourself go. It's the challenge of marriage and committed relationships as a man. As I said, the movement and the constant need and desire for resistance comes from the woman. You provide the resistance. If you are not resistant enough and you don't have the endurance, you're going to snap, she's not going to get what she wants, and you're going to be miserable as well. So it's something that needs to be maintained, that rigidity is both ideological in terms of mental endurance and stamina, but it's also in terms of who you are as a person. Meaning also that all of the hobbies, all of the things that made you who you are before you were with her, you need to maintain and conserve. If you have kids, you're going to have to sacrifice and cut down on some of it. But before that, and that's especially true for lifters, for example, if your girl says, oh, you spend too much time at the gym and you should stop lifting so much and you're already big, that's a shit test. She's seeing if you are willing to give up a portion of who you are, a portion of your personality for her. It's just a way for her to test her powers. Anyone who refuses to see the power relations within men and women relationships is an idiot because they don't understand what life is. Everything is a challenge of power. Everyone tries to expand their power, their will to power. Even kids. A kid, if you have, if you have children one day or if you ever have been around kids, even they do that. They don't know anything. Like they, 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 they haven't been formed culturally. And yet, you will see that they constantly probe and they push to see where the limit is and to see if they can go beyond because they want more power. And guess what? If you let a kid have power, he will take more and more and more. He will keep pushing because there's no resistance. Women are the same. And I'm not saying that women are like children. It's not the case. But they're like humans. We are humans. Men are the same way. I know that for me, it's something that I'm really bad with, meaning that if I'm with people and they don't put up boundaries, I am going to eat them alive. I will devour them. Everything I can take, I will take. I will sprawl. I will make the space my own. The only thing that keeps me in check is people who use strong boundaries and say, hey, that's not okay. You don't do that. And once that is set, I'm good. I've been canalized. It's the same thing for women. But the problem is that you're going to be in an intimate relationship with an entity that feels like it is a never-ending devourer. 
of just everything around you, your environment, your hobbies, everything. And some men, it makes them go insane because they think, wow, what have I signed up for? It's never ending. Well, yeah, it's never ending. It's the beauty of women. It's, it's, the, it's this relentless drive for progression and evolution that they have. That if you see it for what it is, it's beautiful. But if you don't, you're just going to think that she's a witch and you're going to start to hate her. So see it for what it is and actually make sure that you can serve who you are. Your identity is not up for negotiation. That goes for the gym. She wants you to stop going to the gym. Say no, keep going to the gym. She likes you because you go to the gym. It makes you more masculine. So refuse. It's just, again, a test. Just like a kid who asks for two cookies instead of one. If you say no, the kid is not just going to leave and then take a jog on the highway. He'll just take one cookie and that's it. He gave it a shot. He might be upset for five minutes, but then the boundaries that were set will echo with them strong enough that they will be behaving properly afterwards. Women are the same way and your woman will check you the same way with her boundaries and that is very healthy. It's the confrontation that leads to your evolution together as a couple and it brings you together. But with women, there is a specific aspect of the shit test that I don't see developed or discussed enough and that is the abandonment issue which is also coded into their DNA because for a woman, back in the days, for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, if the man abandoned them, abandoned her and the kids, life was over. You couldn't survive without a male in the household. So women are extremely afraid of that. And if you have a girl, you will see that a lot of the, the problems you have or the insecurities that you sense in your woman come from that. She's afraid you're going to leave because... There's a voice in her that says, hey, if, he's, if he leaves, we're in danger. And you will therefore also encounter women sometimes that are going to try and push you away with their behavior. And what they're doing is they're self-sabotaging. They're trying to push you away before you leave of your own volition because it's, it's less painful. They don't realize that. All that I'm saying, they have no idea. But if you know that, you can prevent it. And you can reassure her and say, hey, I will be your rock. You are the sea raging at the rock and you think that the rock is going to leave one day. Well, no. As I explained, the rock, the only way the rock could leave is if the rock gives up and becomes submerged. But you will not let that happen to your relationship. You will fight that. You will, you will oppose your own masculine energy to the feminine energy and that creates life. That's great beauty. That was for the abandonment issue and the fact that women like resistance. Every single relationship that lasts in time is one of resistance. If one or the other party gives up and checks out, the relationship is going to die. And uh, if the woman checks out, well, the mountain stops being challenged and it stops even having an existence as a mountain. And if the mountain gives up, the sea has nothing to fight against and therefore it is for nothing, and that is when the masculine and the feminine become separated and they lose, they lose their very purpose. I know that it's not popular to say that. Many men don't like to hear that their masculinity is deeply linked with the femininity and that it might even only exist to serve it or to protect it. I get why. It's because right now, since the feminine is not fulfilling its purpose, why should we fulfill the purpose? The problem is that it's a very childish approach and that if we give up as the rock, might as well close up shop because humanity is going to be destroyed. We have to be more mature than the enemy, okay? I see too many men who try to fight feminists with their own methods and it doesn't work because their methods are poisonous to start with and they come from their own mental imbalances. Don't do that. Don't allow yourself to do that. Be stoic, be the rock that you are always meant to be. Now, if we're going to talk more about men and women in those metaphori metaphorical terms, there's another one that I like because it offers a more balanced uh, approach and painting of this entire thing. I know some people might be a bit um, peeved by the sea and the rock because it's too antagonistic. If you understood the relationship between rock formations and the sea, you would know that actually it's not. Those two things are very symbiotic in nature. But to, just to, to, to appease you a bit, I want to 
give you another type of metaphor that I think is even better because it really offers the entire spectrum of masculine and feminine tendency as a whole, as a continuum. And that is to think of femininity as dusk and masculinity as twilight. Both, both energies possess solar and, uh, and dark energies, in a sense, toxic energies, if you want to be Manichaean and link dark with negative things. But it does not mean that one has the monopoly on them. It's just that on the spectrum, one is more skewed towards one side and the other towards the other side. Most women are going to fall closer to feminine traits and most men are going to fall, uh, fall closer towards masculine traits. I like to liken masculinity as twilight because to me it possesses similar characteristics. And females and the, the, the female energy in a sense is more like dusk. Twilight is a little bit more oppressive, a little bit more threatening. There is more, in a sense, the sense of doom in twilight. It, there's a closer understanding of impending violence in a sense. With dusk, I always find dusk more comforting, more fresh, more nurturing in a sense. And it's the promise of a new day. It's a promise of life. But dust cannot happen without twilight because they're part of the same cycle. And they're both part of the day and night cycle. So it's not like femininity is the dark or masculinity is the sun. It doesn't work like that. But funnily enough, if you were to look at most religions and especially most animist religions, every single time the moon is seen as a feminine entity and the sun is seen as a masculine entity. That's, that says something. Nature in itself, even though it's not human, possesses masculine and feminine traits. And one of these feminine traits that I want to discuss is, again, the discussion on status, because I think it's very important. Once you have your woman locked and you want to keep her happy, it's going to be very important to understand why she picked you, because now you can then work on reinforcing these traits and she can work on reinforcing the traits that you picked her for which are going to be, for the most part, physical at the start. But then what is going to stabilize the relationship is who she is as a person. I want you really to give yourself the chance to discover women. And I really want, I want you to take it to heart and to think, because too many young men, simps or incels, they're the same in reality, see women only for their physical envelope. And yes, the physical envelope is very nice, but women are truly lovely, lovely creatures. In, in reality, yeah. and it might be taken as something very simpy to say, but women are kinder than men. And uh, it's not a good or a bad thing. They balance us out. But the amount of love, the amount of nurture and of true faithful uh, stability that you can find in a woman is unmatched. And if you allow yourself to tap into that and you discover women, you will be finally in tune with, with this entity that you desire so much. And I found that the more you understand women, the more you love them. Which is funny because the red pill tells you otherwise. All of these red pill morons tell you that, oh, once you know what women are deep down, you can only hate them. That's bullshit. And you know what pisses me off is that the feminists say the same thing. They say, oh, if you come down to what men are with the biological, they're just, they're just pigs and they are despicable. That's not true. We are amazing creatures as well. But if we're only seen through the, the biological lens, of course, everything is mean through the biological lens. Look at sex. If it's just biological, it's what? It's an exchange of fluids? Yeah, who wants that? Well, if you look at it from a more artistic standpoint, it's the consecration of love. It's the creation of life. I would advise you to always, always look at it from both sides. And it's what I tried to offer with my analogy with twi uh, twilight and dusk. But for the status thing, understand that just like women are going to try to change you but don't really want that, women also cannot go back on status. And we're going back to the sea. The sea constantly advances. It retreats sometimes, but it's only to advance again. Look at a tsunami. A tsunami just sucks the, 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 the water out for miles and miles, but it's only to come back stronger. Women are like this too. It's a constant back and forth, which means that they also have a very tough time going back on status, which also means that you cannot let yourself go. You really, as a token of respect for your woman, owe her to be a strong individual because if you start 
lowering yourself and you start being ranked lower in terms of social hierarchies, she's going to start resenting you. But what I explained before, the kindness in women means that she's never going to express it. To give you an example from my life, I was at a point four years ago, I think, where I was borderline obese. I was 240 pounds. I was very fat. And the funny thing is that my body dysmorphia was preventing me from seeing that, but my partner never said anything. She never told me, hey, you're getting a little bit chubby and I don't like it. She never said that. And the reason why is she's kind. She's nice. She saw I was getting fat, but she loved me for who I am. And that is an ability that only women possess. Which is the reason why it also makes me laugh when people try to project male qualities on women and say, oh, they'll, she'll leave you the second that you don't have abs. That's bullshit. You can become a fat fuck, she will stay with you. But it's not a good thing because she's allowing you to lower yourself and it's not making her happy because you are losing what used to make you so masculine and great in her eyes. If she picked you and you're already chubby, then she likes that. It's what she likes in terms of social status, so it's okay. But you must, must preserve who you are and your strength and identity as a male as the token of respect, again, for your woman. It's absolutely essential. Because even though women can love unconditionally, it only goes so far. And the problem is that men can't do that, I have found. If you want to contradict me, it's fine. Men have an easier time giving up on their partner if they perceive a change that is not to their liking and they see that it's going to skyrocket or it's going to snowball out of control, which is also a good thing. Both sides bring to the table what is needed. But you see that with men nowadays, this overindulgence that women offer their men lead to the men not being men anymore and the women then being frustrated and resentful. So it's a cycle that is very dangerous. And as a byproduct, I see many men nowadays who also refuse to express their biological drive and their requirements for women and therefore they don't hold women to the same standards and women also go to shit and both sexes are regressing. It is your duty to make sure it doesn't happen. Because, as I said, girls aren't like us, and that's what makes them attractive. The uh, equalization of genders, as I said, just makes the opposite gender less attractive because they become less and less of an opposite. You need to embrace that. Like All of the weird stuff that your woman does, all of the quirky stuff that sometimes annoys you, that's why you like her deep down. You might not realize it. It's why, you like, it's why you like her. If you're many guys, I see, I hear guys say that and say, oh, I wish my girlfriend was like my best friend, like my bro. No, you don't, right? Because it looks like some dudes think that the perfect woman is the body of a woman and the spirit and soul of a male. But that's not true. What you want is not a bro with tits that gives you blowjobs. You wouldn't like that. You think you would, but you wouldn't. What you like is that femininity. So... Let her preserve that, because by preserving her feminine drive, you preserve your masculine drive. And that's what I spoke about with the twilight, the dusk, and that interconnection between the genders. If you start allowing the other gender to just degrade, you're going to degrade as well. It's the reason why this entire feminist and masculinist thing is nonsense. We need to work hand in hand for the preservation of the species and of our love life. It is very important. Which means that you don't want to become a woman. You want to preserve your own abilities and your own identity. Identical. I keep trying to use that adjective even though it doesn't exist. You want to maintain a strong masculine identity. The way your woman found you, take that and reinforce that and shape that. That's what she wants. All right. She doesn't want the mountain to crumble. She wants it to just keep expanding into the sky. Because that allows the sea to also keep raising and then you raise together. This, however, does not mean that you're going to fall for some of the most uh, dependent pensions that you see within certain males nowadays. Like, for example, depending on your woman to make food or depending on your woman to clean your shoes or to clean your laundry. That is, I don't know why it has seen, been seen as masculine. It's not. It used to be when the man was the provider and the woman was the home, uh, the home caretaker, in a sense, because then both genders had a role. But nowadays, women work. 
So you can't put that weight on a woman's shoulder. It's not biologically her role to do the laundry. It used to culturally be because it made sense, but nowadays it doesn't anymore. So I know that some men want to go back to that. Problem is the economy doesn't allow it. So your good old days are suddenly dead and gone. But the good news is that it doesn't matter. Many people think that because this is gone culturally, then the biological is gone and men and women can't have that type of relationship anymore. It's not true. But the relationship of dominance and submissiveness is going to take place on a different level. And you're going to see that this doesn't include chores. Do your fucking chores. Don't be a baby. When I meet men who are 28 and they say, oh, I can't cook. I want to slap you across the face because you're pathetic. You're a man child. It's not attractive. And it certainly is not something that women like. Uh, unless you're looking for a replacement for your mom and you have mom issues, you don't want to put that responsibility in a woman's hands because it's going to degrade the image she has of you. Women like dependable men who are individuals and who are able to be independent. If you don't have that, well, again, as I said, the woman might not leave you because they're too nice, but the relationship is going to devolve. It's something that I think now I can explain in better terms. It's why I said that men being more decisive in their, in their ability to just cut a woman off if she misbehaves is a good thing. Is because since women don't have that, someone has to do it. But the problem is that if you're a man and you lack that and you don't have the ability to be self-aware, your woman will not provide that for you. So she will allow you to just destroy yourself and herself. Many relationships, and I've said that, where the man wakes up one day and says, I don't understand, she hates me. She's been hating you for 15 years because you constantly make it so that you put responsibilities on her and she crumbles under that weight and she hates you because deep down she thinks, well, it's not my weight to carry, but feminism and the modern world has told her that she should be happy about carrying all that weight. So it's that weird cognitive dissonance within her and it's crumbling her inside. It's like a dark hole forming here and that dark hole is going to swallow up your relationship. So clean, cook, do your own laundry, okay? You can separate the chores if based off of personal time and, and allowances, but never be dependent on someone else for basic stuff like this. It is simply not good as a man. You need to be useful, okay? You need to be a rock. A rock is stable, a rock is useful. Because women also love dependable men, I've already explained that. And you see that because of the tests, okay? The test keep reoccurring because she keeps testing you to see if you are still as reliable as you once were. It's the only way she has. You can't hate her for that. The only way she has of knowing if you're still up to par is to, is to test it, right? How do you test a car? You start it. You don't look at it. You don't ask it, hey, car, are you still a car? No, you try. You try to see if it's going to start. Your woman is going to do the same. But guess what? If she, if she starts the car, it means that she still wants to drive. I could have said she still wants to ride, but too easy of a pun. So try to actually appreciate her for it. Appreciate the effort that she's putting into trying to keep you in shape. And everything she goes overboard, you check her, just like she will check you. That's perfectly fine. It's not sexist. Because all of these steps really boil down to seeing if you're going to be a good mate, which really means if you're going to be a good dad. Because... The amount of shit your woman gives you is like one-tenth of what children will put you through. In reality, it's again linked on evolution. I'm certain that it's a way that women have put in place culturally to make sure that you're not just going to grab your baby by the neck and smash his head into the wall when he starts crying. She's testing your resilience to see if you have the backbone necessary to carry your children. Because that poor woman will carry your seed for nine months. She better be sure you're going to be there afterwards. And you know what? I would even go as far as to say that because women have stopped being exigent enough with their men, that's the reason why so many kids grow without a dad. Because the women don't go into the proper phases of testing for a mate to make sure he's going to stay around. We want women to do that. I know it's insane because a lot of you well, might tell me, well, an age, I mean... 
even with the current requirements, I can't even score a girl or I have a girl and she bothers me, she's annoying. Well, it has nothing to do with their standards. It's you, you're too weak. You're not attractive enough. You're not strong as a mate enough. So stop whining like a baby, get better, improve, okay? You're, the, you're a rock, you're always meant to be that. So, so strive, strive to be that for a woman so that one day a woman can be happy with you. And before that, you need to be happy with yourself. But that just circles back to what I already described. So you will be tested to see if you are a proper dad. And the, the I think is the reason why I like the twilight and dusk uh, allegorical representation so much is because it's, it's, it's more cyclical than the sea and the mountain. It's easier to see the repetition and how one strengthens the other in reality. Because since men have stopped being men, women are not women anymore, and they're not checking their men hard enough, meaning that men are less of men, which means women are less of women, etc., etc. It's a cycle of destruction that we need to stop. And the only way to stop it is to be the archetypal proficient dad. To be someone that a woman wants to make children with, which, by the way, is what they want in terms of evolution. And what we want as well, when you look at a woman and you see a fat ass and large hips and big tits, what you're looking at is markers of fertility. You're seeing if that woman will be able to carry your children. You might not know that, you might just think you like big asses, but you like big asses for a reason, and it's not culture. It's biological, it's a portion of culture, but mostly biological. Women are going to look into men and think, okay, does he have the ability and the characteristics to be a proper dad? If you look at it, height, strength, muscles, all of that serves what purpose? To be good looking when you fuck her? I don't think so. It means that you're going to be a strong dad that can protect the children. That's what it means. Wealth, what is she going to do? Grab a bill and then rub her clit with it? No, she has resources to take care of the baby. That's what, that's what it matters. That's what it means. You're charismatic. It means that people are going to like you and potentially also like your kids. So they have a safeguard if something happens to the mom or the dad. All of that all boils down to evolution. And if you want to even go crazier, it's even more than that. Because what we like in a partner is also what we know other people will like. So when you look at a woman and say, oh, I like her. If you have kids with her, your kids have a chance to look like her. Meaning that men will also like her. You see how deep it goes? We are looking for a mate to produce children that will attract a mate. Same for women. If you ever wondered, and I will make a full video about the topic because it's important. If you ever wondered why women love tall men, it's not just because they like someone that can grab the apples on the top shelf. It's also because they know that they have a stronger chance of making tall children. And deep down, biologically, they understand that this makes a male more appealing. So... Her kid, kid will have kids that will have kids. It all boils down to this. The preservation of your gene, passing down your genes. Understand that, then go back from it, and it's going to lead you to the true essence of women. And it makes them so much easier to understand. Once you grasp that, you can't detest that. Because if you hate it, you hate evolution. You hate biology. Many people hate biology. Many people do nowadays. But... Who cares? Nature doesn't care if you hate it. It's still going to do its thing. Understand its process and you're going to be able to actually work with it. This means that women are the guardians of evolution. They have their standards, they have the things that they want, and it's not up for negotiation and it never should be. Because we want that. We want them to be as hard as possible. All of the shit we see nowadays is a perversion of that drive hypergamy, all of that stuff. It's women who pursue men, but they don't have a reason. It's not to make children. And that is what is making them go crazy also. It is also the reason why these standards are out of whack nowadays. But the existence of the standards and the status of guardian of evolution for women that they get to select their mate, that is there to stay. That is an excellent thing because they have been biologically engineered to be good at that. They only stopped being good at that recently because of a certain degree of cultural perversion that has poisoned their mind. As a male, it is your role to help your woman recenter, and you will be able to do that 
if you are the figure of the good dad, because you're going to provide her with what she wants. What she wants is someone to make children with. So be that. Be that for a woman. And if you can't, and if you're faced with shit tests all the time and it's overwhelming and you're going to go crazy, reassess. Ask yourself, is that the woman for me? I've told you before, evolutionary preferences are gendered, yes, but they are case by case. Some women prefer certain things, others prefer certain things. So you might be with a woman that has a very strict preference on one thing and that one thing you cannot provide for her. So it's making you miserable and her miserable. At that moment, just leave. Like for me, for example, I am not money oriented at all. I don't care about money. It has no drive or grasp on me. I don't. The last time I checked my bank account was three, year, three years ago. I don't even know what's in there. I don't even know what I get paid because I don't care. I don't look at prices. Money doesn't exist in my world. This means that if I were to go out with a woman that is very money oriented and she sees that as a marker of evolution that is important in a mate, I would be miserable because the girl would constantly try to force me to make more and more money against my will. I would resist that. She would be frustrated and it would never end. That is the moment when the entire sea and mountain thing doesn't work. The two are not compatible in that scenario. And in that case, it's fine to just pull out. It's fine to just leave. You are not compatible. It's okay. As I said, not every girl you goes out to will be compatible. To give you a more extreme example, and also another, in a sense, painting of how certain women really don't like weakness. I had a boy who was seeing a girl and he... He's like a 6'4", blue-eyed, blonde hair Viking, okay? He's a very good-looking dude and very masculine, very tough. But one day, he broke down and he cried in front of the girl because of some childhood thing, etc. And wouldn't you know it, two days after that, the girl left, the girl left him. She broke up with him, even though he was like the perfect alpha male, whatever you want. Seeing him cry one time was enough for her to decide, okay, he will not make a good dad. So she left. It's insane, of course, but it's what she was. She had just a detestation for weakness. It was her one thing. She loved him because he was tough and stoic. The second he broke that down, it was over. She couldn't love him anymore. That's an extreme example, but it's one that you will see in your own life. Your woman loves you for certain things. She will push your buttons to see if you're going to budge on these things, as an attempt to see if it's your real personality, if it's not an act. Because too many people, too many men use games. And women know that. Women know that men lie. So they try to make sure that you're not a fraud. Because once she has kids with you, it's over. She can't leave anymore or else she's going to destroy the kid's life and her life. So before that, the entire process is going to take place. You're going to go through it. Don't resent it. And if you can't take it, just leave. Because you never want to get into a point of the relationship where your woman starts to disrespect you. That is the death of love. And not just the death of love. Women are incapable of loving men they don't respect. That is, that is also a truth. I've told you about what happens with you if you beat up a guy in front of your girl. Now, let's talk about what happens if you get beat up in front of your girl. Most of the time, this means that the relationship is over. Because you just got your ass handed to you in front of your woman. You know what that means? It means that in, in the case of an emergency or a fight or whatever, you will not be able to protect her. Because you can't even protect yourself. So you can't protect kids. So she will leave. A hundred percent she will leave. Because you got your ass beat. It's insane. And some people say, well, that's cruel. You just told me that women are so kind and nice. To an extent. All women have their breaking points and certain things that they are just not willing to ne negotiate with. Other things are more lenient, right? My girl, she's lucky because she has a guy who looks like a Greek god, but even if I let myself go, she doesn't really care. But on other aspects, I can tell you for a fact, if I did certain things, like for example, if I showed weakness when a man threatened her, she would be gone. Because she'd be like, yeah, you can't protect me. So I'm going to find a protector. Feminism tells you that women can protect themselves. That is bullshit for the most part. Women, it's not just that they can't fight or don't know how to fight. Biologically, they don't want to. And you can see that when there's an actual street fight, what do women do? They scream. They just scream and they say, stop. Why? Because they don't, they don't want that. 
they don't want to get involved and they don't, they don't also like it. The existence of a risk around them, if they don't have a protector, they don't like it. But a girl that has a man to protect her, she's not screaming, she has a guy right there to protect her. So that's something to keep in mind because if you want to conserve the respect of your woman, you have to understand why she respected you in the first place to keep that going. And if that dies, love dies, right? The respect is gone, she will be gone. And this also can lead to a form of more damaging nagging because if men tend to be more physically violent or at least more potent in our physical violence, meaning that we can actually kill people with our fists, women tend to be more psychological in their approach. And you see that even with kids. Uh, young boys tend to physically bully only. Most of the psychological bullying and the online bullying is done by women, and many people don't know that. But this also means that you might be faced, you might be put in a situation where you're constantly psychologically bombarded by a woman, and you don't have a response to that. Because, I don't know how you function, for me, when someone berates me verbally, my first instinct is to break their neck. And the thing is that it's not something you want to do because it's not very nice to start with. And on top of that, it's just not a sustainable way to approach problem solving. But many men are like this. And the problem is that domestic violence cases tend to focus on men being beating up women because it's visual and it's also immediately evident that there was something going on. But mental and psychological damage doesn't leave marks on your body. And yet it can truly destroy a man. I truly believe that Nagging can be a form of psychological violence if the man is not prepared. So, since in this situation you can't nag her back and you can't beat her up, I especially don't want you to do that, just leave. Take yourself out of the situation. Again, shit tests are supposed to make you better. If they make you worse, something is not working there. You need to pull back and reassess. And just to go on that, because maybe some men are going to ask me, Yes, I do think that men should never hit women. Uh, the entire thing about equal left, equal rights is a result of the destruction of both genders. Men are stronger than females. We also are more balanced emotionally. You should never raise your hand on your woman or any woman for that matter, unless it's to protect your own life or the life of someone else. That's it. If you're just annoyed and you slap a girl, you're a piece of shit. You have no self-control. It is your role to be the rock. It sucks because, yes, you're going to be slapped around by the waves and the waves sometimes behave as if they could take you when they can't. You're the rock. Nothing is going to happen to you, okay? Just steady yourself. Steady your mind and don't let yourself get sucked into that type of foolishness. Sometimes it's going to mean also setting up strong boundaries and you're going to have to teach your woman what is and isn't acceptable. This sounds, again, incredibly chauvinistic and misogyn misogynistic, misogynistic, yeah? Uh, but I think that it's the best way to actually handle a relationship with a woman. Sometimes they need to be told, hey, this is not acceptable. And sometimes they won't even thank you. Not all the time, they won't like you all the time, but it's needed. The strong boundaries are needed, and the only way to put in them in place is to be just direct. If you try to be subtle about them, your girl won't get it. Because... In a sense, she wants you to affirm yourself. So if you're subtle, well, you set up nothing, so nothing has been set up, so she will just continue. Don't be afraid of being direct, of being actually confrontational in that. It's a very important aspect of feminine and masculine relationships. And then the other side of that is that as, in a sense, the, the, the payback for it, you also should give her what she wants. What you get from a woman is the companionship. She gets the same thing. But what I described previously about, you know, the touch and the, the lust and the, the ability to grow with someone, women get the same things from us, but in different shapes and in different shades. And the big thing that women want is attention. Women really crave attention. Women crave attention the same way that men crave intimacy, sexual intimacy. And they can get attention from sexual intimacy, by the way. For them, for women, sex can just be a way to connect with the partner. For us, men have a tendency to always think of sex and everything in life in, in quantifiable measures. Like, oh, we got this much, this much pleasure. She got these many orgasms. 
women like orgasms, but not the way we do. Like well, we engineer everything in our heads and we calculate. They're more about the experience, about the moment, about the connection. And it shows when you discuss sex with men and women, men focus on the quantity. They say, oh, I have, I have I've had sex with 46 women, or oh, we had sex two times or three times in a row. When you talk to women, they don't speak like this. They talk about moments. Oh, we, he kissed me at an instant and I felt protected and embraced. Like, for them, it's more emotional, but it's more, the, it's more the quality that matters than the quantity. And this going, is also going to mean that this attention that you give her is going to be a very important part of the relationship, a part that cannot be taken away because it's cruel. To de deprive a woman of attention is cruel. I firmly believe that. Just like not watering a plant is the surest way to see it die. You want to give your woman attention when she wants it. It's a way for you to show that you love her because go back again to evolution. What is attention? It's a sign that you will be there for her. You can be there for her in that instant for an hour. It's a commitment. It's a sign that in the future she can count on you. And that's incredibly important. To go back to the food thing, what I, the reason why I want you to cook as well is because you don't understand what it means when a man gives food to a woman. You don't. Because we have this stereotypical idea of the woman feeding the man and cooking. But it makes more sense the other way around. Because we're the providers. We give resources. And even if your girl works and she paid for these groceries, cook it and bring it to her. It will be building a level of appreciation within her that she won't even be able to explain to you. But it's deep down, it's rooted in her. It's a way to pay attention to her. You're making sure that she's doing okay. All of these small attentions that look stupid, like putting your jacket around a woman, what is that? What is that sign? You're literally sacrificing your coat to keep her warm. It's a sign and a show that you will sacrifice yourself if need be. Women love that. They absolutely love it. And it's funny because women are seen as the romantic gender. They're not. Most of what women consider romantic is linked to wealth. Like buying her a, ba a, a, a ring or taking her to a fancy restaurant. All of that are just markers of success. You're just showing off that you have tons of resources that you can give her. That's romantic to a woman. And it's funny because every romantic gesture is the same. Again, the code thing. Or like putting your coat on a, on a puddle of rain on the floor. What the fuck is that? Well, it's, a, it's chivalry and it's a sign that you put her first. But do you truly put her first? Not really. You're not really putting her first. You're just giving her attention. You never want to put her first in all things because then you fall into the trap I've already described. A trap that many men perceive. Many men are going to say that my view of masculinity is toxic because... It, it presents it as only exu existing to serve women. I do believe that, but only when masculinity has serves itself first, right? You fill your own glass first before filling everyone else's. That's what being a man is. You are so strong, you are so resourceful that you are overabundant and you can then give to people around you, okay? That's when the protection comes into play. You want to be such a vibrant male that you have those resources available. You don't want to be the petty guy that has just enough. Like, oh, I just have one coat. I won't give you my coat. No. You want to have plenty of coats to cover plenty of people. That's the masculine. That's who we are inside. It's what we've been designed to do. And that's why women love that type of attention so much. So give that to her, but don't spoil her. Just like with the shit test, there are boundaries to be put. You give the attention that you think she needs or deserves, and that's it. No more, because you can spoil her. Just like you can spoil a man if you give him everything he wants, or spoil a kid if you give him everything his heart desires. This is how you keep the relationship stable. Because if you do everything I just described, you're going to keep your woman engaged, so she's going to move, she's going to feel resistant, so she's going to think it's fun. Women love that. They think it's fun. Why do women start arguments? It's fun for them. It's a way to keep some dynamics going. She's bored. She's starting an argument. Next time, make sure she's not bored. She's not one that you must entertain at all times, but you're, you're, you are supposed to be her man. 
You are supposed to be with her, do things with her, give her attention. It's very important. And you will find that a woman that has that type of environment, that type of male, and who is safe, stays. People who tell you that women are these evil witches that just go from man to man and the second they see a better man, they leave. That's nonsense. It's actually the exact opposite of what women are. What these people describe is men. Men are like that. Men are the type to ditch their wife when they're 50 to go for a 30-year-old. That's what men do. Women don't do that shit. A woman will stay with you until the day you die. If you, if you actually treat her correctly and you're a proper man to her and a good future dad, she will be with you through thick and thin. I've seen things, my friends, that brought tears to my eyes. Women who stuck with men through chaos, through illnesses, through death, always. It's the reason why, by the way, if you look at who remarries the most, men remarry after their wife dies. Women don't. Les, les femmes restent veuves. It's the reason why you have this image of the widow. It's because it's based off of biology and evolution. They don't move on. I know a woman who, whose husband died 15 years ago. She still is mourning him. She still wears black. She refuses to go out and party. You know why? Because he was a good man and a good dad. She will not move on from that. She will not move on from the ghost of a man who treated her correctly. Anyone who says that women are heartless are just, you're just purely retarded. You cannot access her heart so you think that she's a monster. Well, it's like Frankenstein creature. Was Fran Frankenstein's creature a monster? No, Frankenstein was. He created that monster and then he couldn't access its feelings, so he thought he was a monster. He wasn't. You don't understand women if you think that they're like that. So, take care of them. Because if you do take care of them and you do accept what I said as truth, you will also realize one thing. Something that is heartbreaking, something that many people don't want to face, but something that is true regardless. And that thing is that everything I just described with women being faithful, if you treat them properly, with them actually being incredibly lovely and just wonderful people, if they are given the proper environment to, th to actually thrive, all of that is not true for men. Because if you look at the sea, and if you look at the mountain again, the sea is constantly in need of the mountain. It's constantly crashing against the mountain. But the mountain, the mountain doesn't necessarily mean the, need the sea, or need that sea in particular. Men have the ability to stand alone. And it's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing, because it means that if you are in this game for a committed relationship with a woman, it's going to be a lot of work on you. And not because it's going to be anything to do with you handling her. That's the easy part, what I just described. Handling yourself is going to be really tough. And I have a lot of experience with that, so I'm going to be able to share it with you. But since men aren't like women, we've already established that. And women are this stable, faithful creature. Then that means that you're not. You're by default and by nature unfaithful. So how are you going to be able to stay? How are you going to stick around with the woman? How are you going to make it work? How are you going to make sure you don't become like one of these people who have kids and then bounce and leave? Because there's many of these people. And you could say they're not men. You're right. In the cultural term, they're not fulfilling their role as a man. But they're males. They're doing exactly what males have been designed to do for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So how do we do better? How do we stay? Well, it's on next part where I'm going to be discussing how not to succumb to lust. So the challenge of the rock trying to remain a rock. I discussed how to actually get to the point where you'll be able to actually find a girlfriend, then how to find one, and then how to actually interact with her as a foreign being, as an entity that you don't understand, and how to come to love her for who she is and use that energy to become better. But what if you don't even want to be better? What if all of that energy goes to waste because you eventually either go away or you're unfaithful? All of that leads to the death of the relationship. And if you've been watching the videos for so long, it's because you want a good relationship. So you're going to want to hear this because the message I'm going to share right now is one that you don't really hear a lot. And usually you even hear the exact opposite, meaning that many times when people discuss masculine energy and especially 
the masculine sex drive and our sexuality, they approach it from a purely biological perspective. And it's a perspective that eventually leads to you just giving up and letting your instincts take over. A lot of the mainstream media is putting their efforts into doing that, into making sure that men revert, that we just completely get rid of all of the, the social work we put in to canalize masculine energy and just let it go rampant, which is you know, a bit strange in a sense, because at the same time, they seem to hate toxic masculinity. So on one hand, they have no problems with toxic expressions of masculinity that destroy men, but they have an issue with some of these expressions that apparently are potentially hurting women. Well, to me, this really shows that there is an, an agenda at play and that the focus is not to make men happy. It's not to keep men healthy. It's, again, to prioritize what they believe to be female happiness, which in reality is their own demise and destruction. So, when it comes to promiscuity and actually being able to stay faithful to a partner, you need to understand that just the fact that you have accepted that this is the rightful path and this is what you need to be doing is good because many men don't. Many men actually would tell you that the goal and the purpose of life as a male is to fuck as many chicks as possible. And this is seen all throughout the media and reality. Like, look at how many role models are seen as alpha males when their life is just an endless succession of escort girl that they fuck. It's all they do. It's get money, get bitches. I just summed up a large portion of role models for young men. And this is the reason why masculinity is in trouble and why people don't have good relationships anymore and why the nuclear family is dying is because this is not the proper way to lead your life as a man. Even though, biologically it is. Because if you were to just look at men from an evolutionary standpoint, it is the best thing to do for a male to just go from one partner to the other and have as many offsprings as possible. It truly is. Because it's, in reality, what the species is supposed to be. right? Go forth and multiply. It's what we are born to do. But that would only be true if we were animals. And since we've ascended the rank of animals and were something much more supreme, it's not true anymore. Meaning that it's not just enough to have a kid. You have to take care of the kid. You have to raise the kid. It's funny because um, I know a guy, the dad of one of my friends, who did what I just described. He went all around the world and he had sex with as many women as possible and he never took care of the kids. And he has like 22 sons, I think, something like this. That guy is not a good dad and he's not a good man. He's a good male, he spread his seed, but he didn't care of, take care of the kids. So he didn't fulfill that role. It is going to be up to you to decide whether or not that's what you want to do. Because as I said, it's very easy to be a promiscuous male. It's not hard. I mean, if you're a little bit good looking and you put in the work and you know how to talk to women, everything I taught you today, you could use for evil. You could go out and just manipulate women. Women are very easy to manipulate. And I say that again from a knowledge standpoint because I manipulated a lot of women. And for me, it was never pernicious. I never really tugged on their biological strings on purpose, but I still, in a sense, did. And the problem is that I did a lot of damage. See, the problem with promiscuity, especially when it's wielded by men, is that it damages the men and the women. It's the reason why I said previously that I don't like hearing guys uh, who complain about feminism because we created feminism to a great extent. And you still see that to this day, where for me, for example, I know for a fact, because I've seen it with my own two eyes, that I've created feminists. I've created bitter women that hate men and will never actually have kids. You know why? Me. Me, because I lied to them. Because I went out with them and I made them think that, oh, maybe one day I'll be your man and we'll have a family. And it never happened. I just used them for sex. What do you think it does to a woman? It makes them go insane. A lot of feminists are created by shitty males. So I don't want to hear guys complain. Maybe you never did that. But if you have dreams or aspirations of fucking a lot of women, you will become that at some point. You will do that. So 
The degeneration of masculinity leads to the degeneration of femininity. The two are linked together. And if you choose to resist, if you choose the path of monogamy, of faithfulness, well, you are going to resist your biolog biological drive, of course, which means that you're going to be a man and not just a male. You're going to be able to transcend that. You're going to be able to actually embody the marriage of the biological and the cultural. And for that, I salute you. Because it's hard. It's hard. It's also the reason why I embraced it for me. Because having sex and casual encounters with women is not hard. It truly is not hard. And I speak as someone who I don't think is particularly good looking. I know I'm not ugly by all means, but I'm not like a babe or anything. And yet I've had an incredibly easy time getting women. And it's getting easier and easier. Meaning that I'm now committed, so nothing happens, but... If you want an anecdote that blew my mind recently, I was on the beach just minding my own business and I was approached by two girls who offered me a threesome. Now, I don't know if they were going to drag me into the bathroom and stab me and then steal my heart, but they looked like they just were looking for a guy to fuck and they picked me. It shouldn't be that easy. That's abnormal. But it's because it's that easy that I always get the sense that there's something wrong with it. There is an issue with this. It is something that should take work. It used to be that a woman would make you work for it. Nowadays, they give it up. It's because they're worse women than they used to be. Their value as women is degrading, so they're just willing to give up. What in reality is very valuable, but society has told them it's not. Society has told them that sex is just sex and it's empowering to fuck random men, so they do it. But we are the first victims in this because it started with us. This idea, again, that men, ancient men used to fuck like 26 women, that's not true. Men back in the days were also committed. You see that in the ancient Greeks. Look at the way the Stoics wrote about their wives. Most people would say they're simps because they say stuff, oh, she's the son of my days and I would die for her. That's being a man. They, got, they, they understood it back then. This entire wave of promiscuity was brought forth by the, the sexual liberation of women because men are always willing to fuck. We're always willing to fuck. The one thing that was holding us in place was women because women were the ones saying no. They were the guardians of sex and therefore the guardians of evolution, morals, even morals. But because they gave up, now we have access to that and it's killing us. So, because women are not going to do the job, and because I can tell you that even if you think you're going to be girlfriendless forever and a kissless virgin, if you keep lifting, you're being employed and you stay clean, you're going to be very attractive one day. And, and when that day comes, you might just snap and be like me and just rejoice in the pleasures of hedonism to realize too late that it's not good. So, make the right choice now. Because it's so hard, it's the reason why it shows that it's good, the good thing to do. Trying to stay as faithful as possible, in the, in the sense of never actually straying from the path, is what you need to impose as a standard to your own self, because your biological demon will not let you do that. So you need to fight it twice as hard, if you want to actually build something with a woman. And I say that as someone who fights that demon every single day. That demon is very strong in me, but I will kick its fucking ass because I'm not going to let it ruin my life. Your sex drive and your libido and promiscuity can ruin your life if you let it. You are the only thing standing between you and your own destruction. You cannot, you cannot, let me stress that, you cannot expect women to do it. Just like I couldn't expect those two college chicks on the beach to leave when they saw I was married. They still came to me, they didn't give a fuck. Why? Because they wanted what they wanted, and the only thing that could save me was myself, was me saying no and leaving. Actually, I didn't even say no, I just autistically walked away, and I hid behind like a dumpster. That's a different story. But um, it's up to you, okay? All of these social constructs that are tying men, and that, that look like chains, they're not chains. They are, what can I use? They're not chains, they're ropes. They're the ropes that prevent you from actually falling. You think there are chains because you're not looking at them the right way. And also because also maybe someone imposed those chains on you. But I have found that chains of self-inflicted disciplines are much easier to bear. You need to put these chains on yourself if you want to be able to resist lust and resist promiscuity. Because casual sex truly is meaningless. 
I've said it a million times in the video, I, I went through it. Like all of the things that you guys dream about and all of the your wet dreams about, oh, I'll have sex with a woman at 4 p.m. and at 5 p.m. I'll have sex with another woman. Yeah, I did that. It's just, it sucks. Yeah, I had sex with two women back to back. Great. What did it bring to my life? Nothing. Nothing. All of the threesomes in the woods are not going to bring anything to your life. It's, it's not helping you build something in the long run. It's some instantaneous pleasure. You feed your biological ego by saying, oh, I'm, I have all of these women. You don't make kids with them. You don't build something with them. So what's the point of you having them? On top of that, you hurt them. I wish I could go back in time and not do the things I've done. I wish I could apologize to the women that I fucked over. But some of them I can't even because their life is, is, is just dead. It's over. That's also the reason why men and women are not equal. What we can do to women, they can't do to us. If you're a solid, strong male, a woman cannot destroy you the way we can destroy a woman. You can... I know women who had a, a bad encounter, as I said in the start of the video, with a man like 25 years ago, they're still broken. They will never recover. Women are fragile. It's our responsibility to not abuse them. It's so easy to get. And that's the reason why also the, the men going their own way who say, oh, I was married and my wife took everything and she broke me. What do you want me to say? You're weak. You were broken by a being that doesn't have the ability to break you. You made yourself available to be broken. That's why she got your ass. That's why. It's the reason why people who complain that the relationships are in balance. They're in balance right now. I'm not going to say anything, but biologically, they're not. Like biologically, we're so advantaged on women. It's not even funny. So we have to have some of the cultural. Not the poison portion of the cultural, but the ones that we used to have in the past that tied us together with women, with the women that we want to build a life with. It's very important because that drive of perversion is not bad in itself. Wanting to have sex is not bad. It's what you make with it that's bad. It's when you have sex with random women that it's bad. And it's an equation and a comparison I hear a lot where people say, well, what is the difference between me having sex 50 times with the same person or with 50 different people? It's still having sex 50 times. Well, the difference is that on one hand, you build something and on the other hand, you're just... It's the equivalent of someone making a castle with cards, with 50 cards, and someone just putting one card and one card and one card and one card. You're not building shit. There's no emotion. There's no relationship being built. You want to build something, right? Or do you just want to have sex for pleasure's sake? Because if that's the case, you're going to be disappointed. Sex is overrated. It really is not that amazing experience that you're going to think it is. Uh, so you're going to go into it looking for something that won't be there. You want to be building. You want that connection. On top of that, if you're really in it for pleasure, the more you have sex with one person, the better it is. Because you start knowing the person and they know you. They know everything you like. So you're the type of guy who says, oh, I just want to come harder for some reason. Well, stick with one girl. Teach her what you like. You're going to see that she's going to get you to heights that no other girl can get you. Because casual sex is often very disappointing in the instant and then afterwards. And again, for the virgins on the channel, just so I can pop your bubble and you don't do my mistakes, the feeling of emptiness you feel in your chest when you wake up from your horny dream next to a woman you don't give a fuck about. Impossible to describe. It's c'est un, un niveau de détresse. It's distress deep within. Well, most of the time, the first thing I want to do is just stand up and leave because it felt so terrible. Don't let yourself do that. The love and the, the care that you think, the tenderness, the warmth that you have when you wait, when you... When you finish and you're near the person you just had sex with and you love them, do you know how good it is? It's better than sex. Like the cuddles and the, the affectionate intimacy afterwards, knowing that you can trust that person with everything and you just gave yourself to them and you were one for an instant. It's insane how beautiful it is. But the problem is that we are vile creatures as men and many men will never get to that. It's the reason why I told you that we need to learn from women when it comes to emotional connections and sex. They got it. The ones that are still uh, sane in the head got it. Strive for that. That is what will make you happy. 
And uh, I've already said that the men going the wrong, the, their own way are wrong, and they are wrong also because their name is stupid. You ever thought about that? Men going their own way. You're going your own way towards what? Because all of these guys say, oh, just focus on making money, don't care about girls. What is the point of making money? To accumulate resources, to do what? To get a house, to get a car? No, to attract a woman. These guys are so lost. It's, it saddens me in reality where they still are chasing after the rabbit, but they don't know why. They forgot why, because they stopped looking at evolutionary standpoints. They are still, in a sense, chasing women. They've never went their own way. Men who go their own way attract women. They end up with very good relationships with women and they build things. Men going their own way are chasing the ghost of women while at the same time hating them and telling themselves that it's not worth it. And you see that. You just take one look at them. Look at pickup artists. They're losers. They're all losers. Look at men going their own way. It's the same thing. Look at these dudes. Do you want to be like them? 45-year-olds, like gray skin, no dreams, and a, like a, an expensive car? Is that what you want your life to be? I'm going my own way. This also shows that these men think that you cannot go your own way when you're married. But marriage opens paths. Relationship with women opens paths because you have access to a, a, an encyclopedia that you never opened before of a different gender. It seems, and women drive men. I've said it in the past. If you have a good woman and she checks you and you know how to utilize that, she will drive you. She will actively make you better year after year. There is a certain level of progression that is not possible without a woman. I said it. Men and masculinity reach, reach a threshold at some point. At some point, you need women to unlock the next level. You need femininity. You need your masculine energy to clash against their feminine energy, to go above, to go beyond. Of course, you need to build enough masculine energy to be able to do that first. So masculinity is not just about femininity, but a large portion of it is. It's like the end game. You play a video game, after level 70, you have the end game. That's the most interesting part. If you refuse to actually interact with women because you think that they're demons, you're going to be like these guys, stuck. That's what describes them, stuck. They're not going their own way. It's men going nowhere. They should remain themselves that. M, G, N, men going nowhere because it's truly what they are. So, to quickly go back on the misconceptions that these people have spread and the misconceptions that women themselves believe in and something that you will have noticed as well, Women don't do sex the way we do sex, meaning that the concept of friends with benefits and even sexual liberation is a concept created by males. It's not a feminist ideal at all because women don't function like this. These are purely masculine ideas driven by the biological, the idea of being able to have sex all the time. Thankfully, women resist that to an extent, but if they didn't, the situation would be even worse, even though you would think that it would be the opposite. Right? Wouldn't it be grand if women wanted to have sex as much as we do? No, it would destroy the species. It would actually destroy the species. It's been tested, by the way. They did that with mice, if you want to check it out. The, uh, the mice utopia experiment, where when the female sex drive went, went into overdrive, it created death. Well, the society just collapsed because masculinity had to actually make up for it, and the males started to refuse to mate. Or the females started to refuse to mate. It created mayhem. And we start to see that nowadays because women are being taught that it's cool to have sex with random people. It's being glorified. And at the same time, stable relationships and especially pregnancy has been demonized in women. And therefore, since they are, as I said, much more of a cultural creature than we are, they are much more affected by cultural shifts and cultural manipulations. But the thing is that in their case, their promiscuity, female promiscuity, is being engineered by the cultural. For us, it's not the case. You don't need to culturally engineer men into fucking random women. We do that by ourselves very well. For us, it's biological. We are being driven by the biological, which is why for women, it is important that they summon the biological back, that they go back to their roots of what it means to be a woman, and for men, it's important that we summon the standards of masculinity that were lost 
the cultural that is going to shackle the biological to keep us going. Both genders, I've said that in the NoFab video, is dealing with its own challenges. Us is that. It's to tame that biological beast. And everyone that is trying to just say, oh no, let it lose. Just be free, man. That's what freedom is. That's not. Freedom is found in the restriction. If you just let yourself follow your urges, how are you free exactly? You're like an animal. Animals aren't free because they don't have free will. We do. So exercise that. Make the choice. It's the, it's the hardest choice, but it's the best choice you can make. Because the pursuit of pleasure is, of course, never going to lead to anything positive in life. That is a rule that you can apply across the board. Pleasure is good, right? Biologically, we feel pleasure in certain activities that are going to be especially important for the perpetuation of the species, but too much of that is never good, ever. So you need balance, you need restriction, and that can only come from the cultural and your own understanding of it. Because promiscuity truly destroys the link between men and women, which is fascinating because you might think, well, sex is a connection, we have more sex with one another, and with more frequency, so won't it bring us closer? Well, no. Look at the state of dating and relationships nowadays. It's ravaged. It's in ruins. Many people will tell you that the dating market is all out of whack. But if you ask a woman and a man, they will both tell you that it's the opposite gender's fault. No one wants to look at their own shoes. No one, no one wants to sweep in front of their, their own door. You need to start sweeping. And if women start sweeping too, great, but we can't influence that. All of the meninists and the men activists that say, oh, it's feminists that did this. No, 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 no. Men, even if they did, it doesn't matter. Because the only thing you do by attacking them is you're making them attack you in return. Fix yourself and then hope that they do it too. I can tell you that they will. Women are not stupid. There is a resurgence of women who are starting to understand that they've been duped, that the entire movement of feminism was an entire farce, and that the only thing that is left for them right now is misery. Some women are seeing that. They're waking up. Are you going to be there when they wake up? Or are you going to be one of these men that is too far gone? Because again, the link between men and women is one of intergender, but it's also one within you. Because you have that within you as well. The connection between those two energies. Before you can experiment that, experience that in real life, it has to start somewhere within you. And as I said, promiscuity damages that. The more promiscuous you are, the more you separate yourself from the ability to have a stable relationship. It's especially true with women. Every guy a girl fucks outside of a committed relationship is like a, a knife in her back. It's another harrow added to her wounds that is going to make it harder and harder to actually hold a man down and have kids one day. It's, it's a baggage. It's, again, it's the, it's the body count. It's not a good thing. But it's also not a good thing for men. And for many men, it's mind-blowing to hear that because for a lot of dudes, their teenage years and their early 20s is just a game of fucking as many women as possible. But what is it doing for you? Again, I ask. Beyond just bragging rights with other idiots that are wasting their lives as well or instantaneous pleasure, what is it doing for you? The answer is nothing. It's not. See, I don't even have to use Puritan or religious moral, moral standards to convince you that promiscuity is bad. I don't. It's not needed. I can just use logic. I can show you mathematically that it's not leading to anything because it is just not. That's what sex with no purpose to build something does. It just ends when it starts. That's it. So just don't do that. And so, because my goal, my job, and in reality the job of every single person on earth, should be to restore the link and the love between men and women, is the reason why I made this video, and is the reason why I am warning you against promiscuity, because promiscuity devises. It does. It devises yourself, within yourself, you lose the ability to actually connect with women, because you start looking at them as just sexual objects to empty your balls. And it's damaging your ability in the future to love one. And you see that with a lot of guys who call women bitches and sluts and whatever. Those names have a meaning. They only regard themselves as their biological self, which is something I warned you against already. They don't understand the poesy and the beautiful literature that exists within a woman's heart. And at the same time, 
it damages them because how exactly are you supposed to get in a committed relationship based on respect and communication with someone that you dislike or that you think is like some lowly beast that only exists to suck your dick? It's not possible. It's entirely impossible. It's the reason why our understanding of the opposing gender, opposite gender, needs to be refined. We need to push away all that meanness, all the vile appellations that women are being fueled with and regard them through light, through what they truly shine for. This is what matters. So reject division. Reflect, reject anyone who is trying to tell you that women are the enemy. It's not true. The enemy is the person who is trying to separate men and women. That is the enemy. That is the enemy of humanity. It has many names, but I'm not going to cite any of them because I'm going to get into trouble. So, some water, and then we're going to finish off. I said that the link between men and women is impossibly important because it leads to children. Children, which, by the way, are the goal of this entire thing. You get a girlfriend to eventually get kids. Many people lose sight of it, but it's the reason why also meaningless sex is stupid is because you're doing something that is supposed to produce offsprings that produces nothing. It doesn't even produce love or anything. At least you think, but the problem is that when you actually have sex with someone, and that's especially true with women, you get attached. A portion of you gets attached because sex is sacred. It's not just in and out, in and out. It's a connection of souls. It, even if you don't realize it or you don't enjoy it as is, it's a connection of souls and it breaks women. I've seen that myself, where I had sex with women and I felt nothing for them and I could tell that they were falling for me. Because it's like cognitive dissonance. The female instinct is like, okay, we're having sex with that guy all the time. And sex is, the be is one of the most important things we can give to someone. So we, we trust him, right? We, we must even love him, right? And so slowly they fell for me. And then I let them down and they went insane because I'm a fucking asshole. Don't be that. Just don't be that. Don't do that. As much as possible, don't. And strive towards the, the, the actual salvation of the nuclear family because it's essential. And at the art of masculine and feminine, there is that. Children. That's what unites us. It's life. Children are life. Lose sight of that. You lose sight of everything. You can just, you can just sign off because your life is not going to be good. And I'm not saying that the only goal of life is children or even dating, but it's a big portion of it. Just like a big portion of masculinity is devoted to the feminine. And funny again, a counter-argument for people who will say that it's not true, wouldn't you say that a big portion of the feminine is de actually devoted to the masculine? That a lot of it is there to serve us? So if they can serve us, why can't we protect them? It's, it's a give and take relationship. It's what makes it work. And it then gives birth to kids. It gives birth to life and the continuation of that energy. Energy cannot die. Right now, it's just that masculinity and femininity are avoiding one another. So we're not actually uniting our efforts. One day, we show again. Because here is where men can find happiness. I'm only 28, so maybe you can tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. But I think I, I, think I got it down. I think I know what happiness is. Happiness is a woman. And I know that woman because she, I live with her and she makes me happy every day and I make her happy every day. Do you understand what that means? It's insane. Most people don't have that, right? Most people don't have that. And I hope that hearing my words create a craving in you. I hope that this is stirring something up and you think, oh, I want that too. Because I know that you do. Everyone does. Everyone does. It's just that we, we just cover that we, and we shovel piles and piles of dirt on top of it with sex and I want this and that. But at the heart of it, we all want one thing. A companion we can trust, we can love, that loves us back to build something with. That's, that's the truth. And that, to me, is what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And I hope that's what you do as well. Starting from scratch. Again, it took me years and years to even get connected to a girl enough to even have a shot at being a potential boyfriend. So don't panic. You have plenty of time. You're lucky also in that as a man, you can start a family in your 40s, 50s. We're not limited like women are. It's also the reason why it's so tragic that so many women are wasting their 20s and 30s because when they wake up one day and they realize that this is what their life should be about, it'll be too late. You, you, my friend, are lucky that you don't have that épée de Damocles above your head. So rejoice. You can make a change. 
And we're going to return quickly on the topic of marriage, because I hinted at it when I told you that marriage was really a feminine institution, and it's true. And uh, the, the red pill would also tell you that. They would tell you that getting married is, a, married is a scam, it's skewed towards women, it only protects women. That is true. You know why? Because the biological is so skewed towards men that we didn't have a choice. We had to have extremely rigid rules in place to make sure that men would actually stand by their kids. It was needed. You can't point it out and say it's unfair. It's unfair now because women are not actually fulfilling their part. That's the reason why it's unfair. Women get to have their cake and eat it. They, need, they get to be shitty women. And on top of that, they get to strong arm us into alimony payments and all of that nonsense. But it's only because the modern age has made it so. Keep in mind that even in the 13 and 1400s, there were laws put in place to make sure that men wouldn't leave their women because it's unfair. You make a woman pregnant, you give her kids and then you bounce. So you just fulfill the biological and then she's, she's just supposed to take care of that. That's what destroys societies, by the way. Because the kids that are created from these unions are unbalanced. They are unable to harness their masculine or feminine energy and because of that, they're certainly completely unable to interact with the other gender. So they are broken adults and they can't have kids themselves. It's the same thing in the mouse utopia experiment. Again, I encourage you to check it out. It's insane how similar it is. You want to destroy a society, you mess with masculinity and femininity. It is the easiest way because you mess with the two energies that create life. So once that is done, it's done. So yes, marriage is a cultural alliance. That is designed after women's biology. It is. It ties a, a man down to one woman so that he takes care of the kids. If we didn't have marriage, you could just go from woman to woman and have a, a gazillion children. But would that build societies? Can we build a good civil society and advance the species like that? No. Ants do that. Animals do that. Are they going anywhere? You never ask yourself that. How come we are the species that makes the least amount of children, almost, there are some that make even less than us, and yet we're the most advanced? Did you ever think about the fact that maybe it was a part of evolution and that this reduction of offsprings and the fearfulness of the male had a role to play with it? I think that it does. I think that it was an important part. So we cannot turn our back on that and we cannot be mad. Or afraid. Many men are afraid of getting married because they think that they are heading into the trap. It's only a trap if you don't actually pay attention or select the mate you're going to get married with. If the person is good, they're not going to wake up one day and be a monster. That's not true. They might become a monster if you let them become a monster by your own inability to interact and if you check out. That is possible. But in this case, it would mean that it's your fault. Always claim responsibility for your own actions. You are a man, after all, and that's what we do. This fear of commitment is a sign that masculinity is regressing. Commitment, responsibility, and duties are masculine words. It is something that men should strive for. We should want to have more and more of that. We shouldn't want to shrug them off, because it's what makes us important. It's our duty on this earth. We were gifted with broader shoulders than women because we can carry more load. That is the truth. It's both in terms of nature and in terms of philosophy. So embrace that. Marriage is a bond that, yes, can be extremely strenuous, but if you enter it in your own good faith and you understand what it's supposed to be doing, you're going to have a good time in. Again, I'm married. I'm having a very good time. Understand that all of these bitter men that tell you that marriage is awful fucked up at some point, but they'll never admit that to you. They'll say, oh, it's, I was perfect and the woman was uh, horrible. How likely is it? How likely is it that all of these boomers, all of these stupid men going their own way, actually were just unlucky? And one day their girl woke up and fucked the postman. Zero percent. Women don't function like this. So the best thing to understand from that is that you shouldn't be afraid of commitment. Commitment is an important part of creating relationships with women because it's a marker of their own survival. You cannot expect a woman to not want you to commit. It's their only safeguard. If they don't have that, they're fucked. 
at least give them that. At least give them the privilege and the benefit of that. But I understand your doubts, and I also understand why people utilize your doubts, because there are many, many individuals that are making bank and making a lot of money and getting views and getting traction off of these fears. Or they see the state of femininity and masculinity, but instead of fixing it or telling you what it is, instead they accentuate the damage and then they say, oh, look, it's not going right. You should be very afraid. Listen to me. I'm going to tell you what it's all about. That's the Red Pill 101. The Red Pill is supposed to be a pill you swallow to see the truth. What most people feed you is a black pill, painted as a red pill. What they say, oh, the situation is, it's over, right? You, you ever heard that sentence, it's over? It's always in relation to women. These people are obsessed with women, and at the same time, they want to convince themselves that it's doomed, that the situation cannot be bettered. Not true. I think I've shown to you that it's incorrect, but our mindset is very damaging because it taps into your fear. The easier way to manipulate people is through fear. We're seeing that nowadays. So resist. There is no place in your heart for fear. Be stable, be a rock. That is what is needed of you if you want to get out of that slump, because I know you can fill the slump, but are you going to be willing to actually extubate yourself from it? That's a different question. It's up to you. I can't do it for you. And that if you actually are willing and you grab the sword and you take up the fight will mean that you are going to be combating feminism, masculine agents of whatever protection of my ass. I don't know what names they give themselves. All of the people who stand between you and the feminine, all of the people who are going to tell you that you don't need to have a wife, just like the feminists tell the women that, oh, you don't need a man, you don't need no man, bullshit. We need each other desperately. Because whatever we can build a value in this life, we do it together. But, oh, I'll have a company and I'll make a lot of money. Great. Super. super. That's cool. If that's what you want to do. But most people would be better off actually just doing the easy thing. And the easy thing is the hard thing nowadays, which is starting a family. That's, that's the best way to be productive. It's to create people who are going to be productive. It's out of topic, but you get where I'm coming from. Really be careful with that type of messages, the type that try to look at the biological drive and they try to manipulate it to fit their needs because they, they're selfish. You see that a lot with people who don't want kids. They'll really admit that it's a selfish impulse, but it is. It's incredibly selfish. And it's again utilized because people are selfish. And if you can give moral reasons for people to be, they will embrace them because it makes them feel better. The shame portion of it is important because it reminds people what is right and what is wrong. So as a man, understand that marriage isn't death. Marriage is just another iteration of the commitment. You don't need to actually give institutions power and get married in front of the mayor, but you need in your heart to have that discussion with yourself and commit. I know that for me, I had it before getting married where I was in bed and I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to be with that woman for the rest of my life and I'm only going to have sex with that one woman. Am I okay with that? If I cannot say yes, I shouldn't get married. I should just not get married. And I thought, and the answer was an evident. It was yes. It wasn't an easy answer, but it was evident. And to me, it's what to this day I carry in my heart that makes me very happy is that I made that choice. I'm proud of myself for making that choice. Because the easy way out would have been to just keep having sex with random, random women. That was very easy for me. Instead, I chose commitment. I chose to select one woman and say, okay, it's you. Out of the, the billions of women, I selected you. Does it mean that she's the one or the soulmate or the twin flame? No. But I don't want her to be that. I want to be the one that decides that she's that. Nature won't decide that for me. I will culturally decide that I will make her that. Because you make your soulmate, they're not born. You create them with your own efforts. And the effort coming from the male is commitment. So commit. Commitment is life. Commitment is the masculine. It's what we're always meant to be doing. And if you want to elevate yourself from the simple rank, rank of male into man, and then be able to have a family one day with children and great children and build an empire, a biological empire, you know the way. Now you know the way. 
And I'm going to end with that. Um, there also was a long video. It's longer than the NoFab video. I'm not going to make a gazillion videos about women because, as I said, many channels do that and it's just a trap because they understand that you guys are really interested in that type of topic because you sense that there is a problem with women and men nowadays. So I put everything in one video. I will make more videos about femininity, about women, etc. on different topics that I want to discuss more. If there's a certain topic that you heard on the video that you want to hear more about, you let me know. But for today, we are going to end on that note. Thank you for watching.